three. Hi, everyone. You are watching the third edition of Serverless Days Virtual. Uh, this is the last one we're going to do this year, and we have an absolutely awesome show planned for you today. I call it a show because, listen, this is exciting for me to watch. I hope it's not just like a regular old boring conference. This is going to be something that, um, uh, that that's going to that's going to inspire you. That's going to make you think serverless. That's going to want you to do more with serverless. So um, we have, a, like I said, a very uh, excellent lineup today, and we will uh, we'll go into that a little bit more. So um, I always like to start these conferences this way. This is a virtual conference, but if you've never been to an actual serverless days conference um, before the pandemic hit. Um, these are great. These are very community focused. They're local, right? Which means that they're happening near you. You don't have to fly to Vegas. You don't have to, you know, go somewhere uh, in order to get to these things. Instead, you can come to a local place. They've happened in Boston. They've happened in Atlanta, in Austin, in uh, Los Angeles, in New York, and then all around Europe in Turkey, everywhere. Um, and so these are great events. They're organized locally. It's all nonprofit. Um, and it's just great to get together and network and learn about serverless technologies and what's happening in serverless. Like I said, COVID-19, this has just it forced everything to be sort of postponed and canceled. So hopefully at some point they'll start up again and you'll be able to kind of go and meet people in, con uh, meet people in person, which would be wonderful to get out of our houses uh, and be able to actually see people again. Um, but because we have such a dedicated serverless community, and so many people that want to make sure that the word of serverless has continued to be spread. Um, there was a group of organizers who are absolutely, and they're amazing. And I was trying to think of names for them, um, uh, you know, just like sort of nicknames for them. Um, and, and then the first one is Ant Stanley. Ant was one of the founders of Serverless Days. Um, we've got uh, Farrah Campbell, who is absolutely amazing, doing such amazing work around serverless and helping to spread it around. Uh, Gunnar Grosh, I think we maybe call him Gunnar Chaos Grosh, um, you know, spreading all this stuff about uh, chaos engineering and how we can test our apps to make sure they're more reliable and more resilient. And then we have Emre Shandan, who is doing amazing work in observability with his group at Thundra. Um, just things that are that are just pushing, you know, moving that ball forward with serverless. Um, those are the four people who are responsible for making this happen today, as well as a couple of sponsors that we have that are helping us to support this. Again, we you know are streaming this. We're, there is some cost to this and things like that. And these uh, are the groups and the organizations that are really helping this uh, make this happen. So I do want to thank our sponsors. First of all, is Thundra, um, Thundra.io. Uh, absolutely um, uh, amazing company. Uh, again, Emra doing some great work over there. Stackery at stackery.io, uh, awesome tool for, for helping you to deploy your serverless applications and coordinate with security and things like that. Senso uh, is, is training people. They have a, a homeschool offer, dev that you can check out, sign up for some classes there. And Epsigon, another amazing uh, observability company doing great work with containers and serverless uh, and microservices. So definitely check out those sponsors. All right, so we have a very, very busy and packed schedule today. So for about the next four hours or so, you'll hear some of uh, some talks from some amazing people in the serverless community. So we've got Chris Munns from AWS. We've got Susanna Kaiser. Um, we've got Slobodan Stoyanovich, Alexandra Abbas, uh, Marie Hogar, uh, uh, Nicole Yip, and Hannah Tucker McClellan, um, all that are going to be delivering some really, really amazing talks. So I hope you will stick around for those. Um, the schedule is up on the website at virtual.servlessdays.com. Um, so if there's something particularly, you know, you want you take a break or so forth, there'll be some breaks in there. Um, but really, you should listen to these talks. They are absolutely amazing. Um, all right. So uh, when we get to meet people at a conference, that is one of the most amazing things. We get to ask questions. We get to interact with people. We're not together, but we have set up, uh, set up a Discord channel that you can find. Just go to virtual.serverlessdays.io. Uh, the link is right there. Click in there, register, um, and you can ask questions of the speakers. There's a hallway track that you can just ask questions in general. There's a whole bunch of great serverless people, um, you know, people from the serverless community that are in there right now um, that would love to chat with you and would love to point you in the right direction if you have questions and would just love to hear your ideas and thoughts um, and participate in that. Um, so serverless days has right from the beginning been all about being inclusive and accepting of everyone into our community. Um, so we do have a code of conduct. So if you are going to use the chat, 
Um, in the Discord channel, we have a couple of moderators in there that want to make sure that it is a safe space for everyone. So just a couple of quick tips or uh, I guess rules to remember. Be nice, right? We are not um, we're not uh, hacker news, okay? So we are going to be nice to people. Um, you know, it's fine to challenge ideas, but let's not get into heated debates, all right? Let's just um, you know share your ideas and 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 move forward with there and maybe take that discussion offline if you think it needs to it needs to happen there. So obviously nothing that's uh, you know not safe for work. Don't be rude. Don't be annoying. Um, you know, and let's not try to spam anything with advertising. And we are going to use English to communicate, just so that everyone in the channel, um, there's a that we're happening at you know 9 a.m. on the uh, on the West Coast, noon on the East Coast, um, and then afternoon, evening um, in Europe. So we want to try to just make sure that everyone can participate in these conversations. Uh, again, no advertising, no DM um, advertisements either. Please don't send messages to uh, uh, people individually with advertisements. Uh, also, avoid offensive usernames and nicknames. Don't use any bots or user bots. Uh, try to use the appropriate channel when you're talking with other people. So like we said, there is that hallway track for attendees. Um, so if you uh, if you want to just kind of ask general questions, that's where to ask it. If you want to ask specific questions about a topic or a talk, please do that in the rooms that have been created for each one of the speakers. Um, and again, we really encourage you to ask some questions. The speakers will be responding uh, to those questions and we'll have a little follow up after each uh, talk where we can ask some of those questions to the speaker live. Uh, if you have any problems, reach out to Ant, reach out to Farah or Gunnar or Emra um, and just let them know that there's some sort of issue. And then of course, you know, the most important thing is we wanna make sure we have fun. Um, all right, so those are the rules. Um, and so again, awesome conference today that uh, with some amazing speakers. So I hope you will stick around and you will enjoy it. So I have actually been at, um, today before we start the conference to kind of give a wrap up of, uh, of serverless in 2020, which is a really, really tough thing to do because so much has happened with serverless in 2020. So what I want to do is I picked seven major topics that I think um, are sort of indicative of what's happened in 2020 and what I think you know we should be looking for uh, as we progress into 2021 um, and where you know sort of serverless is going to go. Um, so I am going to mention some company names because I think a lot of players in this business have uh, or players in the community have been contributing. I'm not going to mention everyone. I'm not going to remember everyone to mention. And that's a good thing because there's just so much happening. And it's a really good indication that serverless is continuing to grow um, and we've got more and more adoption. So the first thing I want to start with, and I think this is um, you know, been an ongoing theme in service, um, has been observability, right? So we have a number of startups that are continuing to grow uh, that are in the serverless observability space. And some of those have also started to diversify uh, into containers and microservices. So like Epsigon and Thunder, for example, um, not only do serverless, but they also get into containers and into microservices, um, which is good. I think that's a good way for the, for the, uh, for the, I guess the ecosystem to continue to grow and to make sure that for a lot of these hybrid approaches, which is what we see with serverless applications, you have full observability across them. There's a few companies that are still primarily focused just on serverless observability, like Lumigo and Dashboard. Um, and again, they have very, very specific tools for serverless, which is also nice to see because, again, if you are building completely serverless applications, looking at a tool that is specifically for that is very, very cool. Um, we've also seen a number of large players that are in the, you know, in the sort of the general monitoring and and observability ecosystem um, starting to get into or getting into serverless very, very heavily. So tons of progress has been made at Datadog, tons of progress at New Relic. There's a couple of other um, companies that are acquiring companies to, again, expand the serverless offerings that they have as part of their observability. Um, for exa example, last year, New Relic acquired IO Pipe. Splunk has just made some recent, uh, recent acquisitions that are trying to grow um, their serverless offerings as well. Um, so that's a, it's interesting sort of where that's going. And of course, AWS, as well as all the other cloud providers, have invested heavily um, you know, in this area of observability. It has been a weakness um, you know, being able to sort of trace and track and, and see where all these things are happening within your applications. Um, and so AWS CloudWatch has launched a whole bunch of new features. And of course, X-Ray continues to expand its capabilities where it can integrate um, and, and trace through SNS and some of these other uh, service that, um, uh, that are being built out uh, or that are being, that need to be tracked. Um, and that 
that sort of brings us into this idea, the next topic, which is sort of this idea of debugging and development workflows. I have an ongoing joke in the newsletter that I do, the Off by None newsletter, that talks about someone's serverless CI CD setup. And pretty much every time you see one, it's something different. Um, now, there are tons of tools um, that can help with, with setting up CI CD. Um, specifically for serverless, depending on how you're building your applications, um, you know there are multiple multiple different ways that you can do this. So I still think in 2020, debugging and development workflows still remains a largely unsolved problem, but there has been a ton of progress made towards that. So if we look back, we can see that Serverless Inc., you know, makers of the Serverless Framework, they launched their pro version that incorporates a CI CD process that also has some guardrails in there, so some added security. Stackery has done a number of uh, investments and have added some additional tools to help people collaborate on infrastructure um, and their applications, as well as enforcing security policies. Um, plus, you still have other providers uh, like C.run that are continuing to work on ways to sort of standardize and make it much easier to deploy deploy applications. Um, SAM, the serverless application model that AWS has, um, again, they have, uh, you know, th there's there's patterns there um, that are trying to help sort of standardize the way that we're deploying uh, our serverless applications. But again, I think there's still more work to be done. And I, I look forward to 2021 that this will be a continued problem that will have investment um, and we'll see some cool things out of there. And the other thing, and there may be more tools that do this, but the one that I want to call out here is Thundra because they have a very cool IDE plugin that lets you debug your Lambda functions from your VS um, uh, from VS Code, right from your IDE. So that is kind of a cool feature. I think there are some others that do this as well, um, but Thunder's the one I'm most familiar with. But this is kind of cool because this continues to be a problem where you know some people are saying, well, you should just be developing in the cloud, but lots of people like their, their own little workflows and their development tools and their IDEs. So it's usually helpful to be able to do that from your local, um, from your local IDE. Uh, I know AWS has some plugins as well that help with some of this stuff, um, but I do think that uh, this would be something interesting to just sort of solidify these uh, development workflows uh, and these debugging workflows so that we can not only you know, uh, deploy our applications to the cloud more reliably, but also be able to you know, sort of test those um, using the cloud as, uh, as the final testing ground as, as opposed to trying to replicate some of these things um, locally. All right, another major topic I think um, that needs to be sort of explored more um, is security. Um, and I think what's interesting in 2020 is there are no dedicated security vendors specifically for serverless, at least not that I know of. We used to have um, we used to have Protego and we used to have, um, why am I drawing a blank? Um, we used to have uh, 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 the one that's uh, completely drawing a blank, sorry, uh, uh, that, that's was acquired by Prism. So we have these, we have a couple of security vendors that were specifically for serverless, but now they've been sort of observed by, absorbed by these uh, larger secure, uh, PureSec, I don't know why I couldn't remember that name, um, but they've been absorbed by some of these larger sort of cloud security vendors. Um, and they've sort of consolidated serverless uh, and, and the capabilities around serverless into the same thing. Now, there are all kinds of uh, reasons why serverless security is right out of the box, much more secure and things we don't necessarily have to worry about. But I did find it interesting because I do read a lot of papers and a lot of uh, news that comes out. And there was a, a fairly recent study that said that 60% um, of people who are not using serverless yet, so this is 60% of companies who are not using serverless yet, they actually, their leading concerns are actually security. Um, and which is interesting because I think if you if you've been using serverless for a while and you understand application security and with the shared responsibility model, we know um, that right out of the box, you know, serverless is is more secure. Granted, you still have to worry about application security, but I thought that was an inter interesting statistic. So it'll be uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens and whether or not security in serverless is addressed more, um, and and whether it even needs to be. But it certainly sounds like if you've got a lot of companies who that's their leading concern why they're not adopting serverless, then there's either a lot of misinformation out there um, or just not enough clear information as to um, you know what the benefits are and 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 why you know the security might not be a huge issue for you. Um, all right, another major thing that happened, I think, in 2020, and, and this was something that you started to see at the end of 2019, you've had some players in this space, um, but this is this idea of edge computing, right? So we're not talking about just putting a CDN in front of something and caching static assets. We've seen quite a bit of movement and development in edge computing. Um, so Cloudflare has been out there very, very early. 
Um, they have the Cloudflare workers. But we also saw Fastly, and Fleev is the one that made some investments in another company um, where they're using cell phone towers to actually do serverless compute at the edge, which is kind of crazy. Um, you have other companies like Limelight and a few others that are in there. And it's not only compute either, there's a lot of data happening at the edge. And I think this is interesting because again, depending on how you want to conflate the term serverless, um, this is sort of an interesting approach to building applications because we're not home running for data anymore, right? It, it's, it has been becoming easier and easier to build static applications um, that span the globe, right? And you have that, you have a very fast access to those static assets because of the edge locations. Um, but doing the compute there is only one piece of it, especially if you're going to need data, which comes to data replication, which we'll talk about in a second. But what I also want to talk about with the idea of edge computing is where that extends is I think Jamstack and serverless have made a really, really interesting, I guess, merger um, in 2020. Now, Jamstack obviously is for building uh, websites and applications um, that are sort of user facing there. Um, there are a million other use cases for serverless that happen behind the scene that never, you know, never get through an API gateway or never have sort of a web component to them. Um, but I think Jamstack has been one of those things where because it's become so popular uh, and because you have static site generators that are becoming more and more popular and new tools like Nuxt and Next and all these other things that are, are making it so that you can do static site generation with uh, 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 dynamic components, whether that's with Vue or React, um, and making calls to APIs, um, companies like Vercel and Netlify um, have done some really interesting work in terms of how they've serverless into the idea of you know being an extension of the Jamstack, um, and also Amplify the Amplify framework from AWS is making this um, you know sort of very very easy for front end developers to start developing highly scalable applications that run all around the world with data. Uh, with uh, some uh, some bit of di you know dynamic uh, uh, data that they're pulling in, so I think it's very interesting that all of that is kind of happening. Um, you know, and again, it's sort of an aside, but pay attention to edge computing, pay attention to where the Jamstack is going to bring you, especially if you're developing a SaaS app or any application that has uh, a front-facing component. Um, I think you're going to see more movement on this, more maturity in this space, um, and it's going to be something else that we have to think about. Um, so then another thing is data. Uh, and data was, again, data is always an interesting uh, thing here. And then we talked briefly about this idea of, you know, these global data stores are needing to replicate this data down to the edge level. Um, and that's interesting to me. I, I find that really, really fascinating um, how that works. And obviously, you've got a global KV. I keep saying obviously. I apologize for that. But there is a, something called the global KV that, um, that Cloudflare has that does a replication that allows you to access data from different edge locations um, and have... Uh, have that data sync. So that's interesting. Um, in terms of the major players that we've seen with with sort of what we would call serverless, uh, I guess serverless databases, uh, DynamoDB continues to be popular. We're seeing more and more popularity uh, around DynamoDB. Uh, I'm a huge fan of DynamoDB. Um, we we saw AWS try to address the SQL or the RDBMS sort of approach to to data um, last year with Aurora Serverless, um, and this year they've made the RDS proxy um, available, which is a good component to help with that sort of uh, that zombie connection and the and and the uh, the connection pooling issue that you have from any type of function as a service. So that's interesting. There's been more progress on that. Uh, you still have Firebase. We still have BigQuery. These are all tools that are very very good at creating um, you know large distributed data sets that you can access quickly without having to worry about um, uh, without having to worry about installing software and patching and, and scaling that sort of stuff. Um, but there's also some emerging players in this space. So FaunaDB has become, uh, I think, very popular. Um, that's an interesting uh, service that they're building out, which again is a serverless, uh, you know, serverless, no SQL database, but also has some, you know, interesting query capabilities in there. Cosmos DB from Microsoft, from the Azure platform, they just um, announced earlier this year that there's now a serverless component to that or a serverless version of that, um, which is is again getting into this getting into the space of, of making data more available without people having to manage um, you know sort of the growth of that or manage that that scalability uh, piece of it. 
Redis store. This is something interesting that came out this past year, uh, or at least has, has gotten a little bit more traction. This idea of having a serverless Redis component. Uh, this is a separate product that's sold, but uh, again, if you don't want to be connecting to a VPC in your Lambda functions or any of your other functions, um, being able to connect to a uh, HTTP connection to Redis is is uh, is kind of interesting to me as well. Um, and then we saw some new purpose bases. Timestream just launched this year. Uh, you know, so that you have the ability to to do time stream data or time stream database without needing to sort of build extra, you know, extra layers around a DynamoDB or a BigQuery or something like that. Um, so I think we're going to see more purposeful built databases um, that are going to start taking on the load of, of some of these uh, more abstract uh, services that we have out there. Um, and again, we mentioned global data stores. I'm going to be really interested to see uh, where AWS goes with this, um, you know, what happens with Lambda at Edge um, from a compute standpoint as well as from data standpoint. DynamoDB has global tables that replicate, but again, they replicate to the regions, not to uh, the POPs, the points of presence around the world. So it'll be interesting to see where all that goes. All right. I'm almost done, promise. So I want to finish up on this idea of containers. And it's funny because we think back maybe two years um, and there was a lot of talk of like serverless versus containers. Um, there was even a rap about it. Um, and, uh, and I think there was a tension between those two things. Uh, just because containers, I think, were more towards Kubernetes and this idea of orchestration, uh, orchestration managers and things like that, or, or orchestrators that that just kind of uh, made it seem like it was more operational work or more things that needed to be invested in order to get up and running, whereas serverless was focused more on the, the idea of these smaller functions um, and Lego, you know, Lego blocks connecting all these things together. So I think that's still somewhat the case. But what we've seen over the last two years, um, and I think this has just sort of grown more in 2020, is something like Google Cloud Run, as well as AWS Fargate, which sort of talk about serverless containers. Um, and so forget what serverless means, because I think we've, we've gotten to a point where it's very, very hard to just you know, classify what exactly serverless is. Uh, but I think what we've started to see with, um, with containers versus the execution environments that are specific to FAST uh, or functions as a service is that there's this convergence of these execution environments. And so you're with Fargate, even though you can't trigger them off of events yet, Cloud Run is, I think, only triggered off of, um, off of HTTP events. I think there's other ways that you can trigger it as well. Um, but it's not quite as event driven as uh, as a lambda function might be, or as a Google uh, you know as a Google Cloud function might be, but we're starting to see where now people are building their own execution environments because either they need more uh, they need, need more dependencies that they want to install, they want to have more control over that, um, and turning to things like Cloud Run and Fargate, whether that be for uh, whether that be for more concurrency, whether that be for uh, longer running tasks. Um, but I think we're going to see in 2021 more of a, of a convergence um, of execution environments and more control over the execution environments that you have, um, whether that be Fargate, Cloud Run, Lambda, uh, Azure Functions, or whatever. I think you'll you'll see more more control um, to the developer. Now, whether that's a good thing or not, I love the simplicity of just running a function. Um, but that's something that I think will potentially happen. Um, and then the last thing I'll say about containers is what we've seen a lot this year that started sort of at, uh, at least for me, where I started to see more of a, a play towards this was at reInvent last year where they announced EKS or they, they expand EKS. Uh, which is the uh, the uh, Elastic Kubernetes service that AWS has that essentially manages your Kubernetes cluster for you without you having to do it and can run those can run those um, pods and stuff on Fargate. Um, I think that's really interesting, but that's where I think we're moving to as well as as as, as uh, cool as Kubernetes may be for people who like to have all this control. Um, it is you know I think objectively difficult to manage. And these larger companies, uh, these larger cloud companies like AWS, like Microsoft, um, like Google, uh, taking over the management of Kubernetes systems, essentially, as those become more managed, it seems like they're just abstracting those away to get back to some other form of serverless. I could be wrong. Maybe it's just me hopefully thinking that, again, Kubernetes will be less important and will focus more on building applications. Um, but that might just be me. All right, that's my wrap up of 2020. I don't know if you've learned anything. I know that there's been a lot happening. I'm really looking forward to 2021 because I do think we're going to see some very, very interesting movements, especially as more people continue to adopt serverless. 
Okay, so hopefully we have Chris Munns available. I'm just going to switch my screen over here. There he is. Chris, how are you doing? I'm doing well today, Jeremy. How are you? I'm doing well. Hopefully uh, I didn't rant for too long about serverless, but um, speaking of serverless, speaking of serverless uh, you uh, have been involved right from the beginning with AWS, uh, and you are going to open this talk uh, telling us about the last six years of it. So Chris uh, Munns from AWS, thank you very much. Take it away. Thanks, Jeremy. And it's awesome to be here with you all today. Uh, I've had the opportunity to speak at a couple of uh, serverless days events now historically. So I make sure is my video up for folks. Can someone in the chat? I'm watching a live stream, so I don't see it yet. I guess uh, I just have to catch up. Yeah, okay. it has 30 seconds behind. Yeah. Okay. Now I see myself. Apologies. Cool. Uh, again, uh, thanks for having me here today. You know, I've had the opportunity to speak at a couple of serverless days events now, uh, including way back in the day, getting to attend uh, Ann Stanley and Paul Johnston's. Uh, among many other people's first, uh, Jeff Kampf. Um, and it's great to see this space grow. And it's been really awesome to see all of you who helped make serverless days possible around the globe. Um, it's, again, a very different year, unfortunately. I would love to be uh, in front of you in person, on a stage somewhere, getting to spend time with you all. Um, but uh, again, really appreciate the sponsors that helped make this happen. Really want to thank Jeremy and Farah and Emra and Gunnar and all the other folks that have helped make today's event. Uh, happen here. So I'm going to share slides, and it looks like because of using the uh, the Skype browser, I can't also have my video on, but but I am here. So give me one second to to pull this up. All right. So. Uh, again, my talk for today is six years of serverless, or why <laughs> I've forgotten how to SSH. Um, and when I talked to uh, Farah, Jeremy, and Emra about my talk, you know, I really was trying to figure out what the be the best thing to cover in this space and time were. Again, a little bit more about me. So I work at AWS, Amazon Web Services. Been at AWS now for just about eight and a half years across a couple different roles. Uh, and for shy of the last four years, I've been entirely focused on the space of serverless. And so uh, you've probably, if, if you are an AWS customer, either seen talks by myself or my team of people who I work with uh, about all of the various technologies that fit into the serverless space. So if you've read blogs on the Compute blog or seen us at reInvent or summits or serverless days or all sorts of tech events, uh, as a developer advocate, we're here to work with you know, you to talk with you, to explain things to you, and to teach you how this stuff works. So uh, what is this talk about here today? Well, we're interestingly enough coming upon the sixth birthday, as it were, of serverless. Um, I was uh, happy enough to be in the audience back when we first announced Lambda all the way back in 2014. Um, and so this has been an, an interesting six years, at least, of this space and this paradigm of what's going on in technology. So, you know, we should celebrate that. And again, happy birthday to Lambda. You know, have some cake, take that cake and eat it up. And it's been funny over the last couple of years. Uh, again, the last four for me personally in, in working with and representing these technologies and working with the teams that build it, um, some of the, I would say, you know, naysayers, detractors of the space. And so uh, we've all heard that, you know, unfortunately, serverless is dead. Um, it died in 2017 and 2018 and 2019. Um, but this is not about serverless being dead. I actually covered that back in 2019 at uh, Serverless Days Austin. And so you can find the talk about that. But uh, I was really chagrined to recently find out that actually serverless had stalled. Um, and so serverless stalling is the new serverless is dead for 2020. Um, and so that was uh, some interesting news for those of us in AWS and the Lambda team. You know, really rough to have to go up in front of Andy and let him know that serverless had stalled, um, which again, isn't something that we've seen ourselves. But I digress, that is not what is important today. What we wanna talk about again is this fact that we are six. And now that we are six, a lot of things have changed. A lot of things are different. A lot of things are new. Um, and as a testament to everyone that joins events like this and the events like this around the globe, 
and consumes serverless content at AWS and is working on serverless products. Um, you know, it's been an interesting space to watch over the last couple of years as things have evolved and grown. Again, where did it all start? So back in November of 2014, November 13th to be exact, so we're just about two weeks away from this actual sixth birthday, uh, we announced AWS Lambda. Um, and I, I went to say in my talk about serverless not being dead last year that uh, when we first launched Lambda, we actually didn't use the term serverless. And so I'm not going to specifically dive into what serverless is or where it came from or any of that. We've already kind of been there. And again, this is not meant to be a deck or a talk that is completely focused on what Lambda is. But what I want to spend some time exploring today is, is a really interesting concept that I see us in now, again, six years into this space. And slight promotion here uh, for this really awesome book by Nader Dabit, who happens to be a peer of mine at AWS. He leads the developer advocacy team for our, our mobile services uh, and a number of technologies that we have here. Uh, he recently uh, published, or he recently wrote, and then O'Reilly published a book called Full Stack Serverless. And uh, when I got it, I just thought, man, full stack. Uh, full stack is such a, an interesting, loaded kind of a term. And uh, you know what could it possibly mean to be full stack serverless? And what does that look like? Uh, again, you could cheat and read Nader's book and and log off now, I guess, if you wanted to. But um, again, six years in and and seeing this kind of be something that we're talking about, I found uh, really exciting, really intriguing. And for me personally, I have not been a fan of the term full stack. Uh, I've always been. Kind of thrown off when I've heard someone say they are a full stack engineer. Uh, I've been almost sometimes uh, unbelieving of teams that say that they are full stack teams, you know, small, you know, squads or pods, if you will, that build and own the full stack. Uh, now, why am I so disbelieving of this? Well, I am effectively an old school infrastructure guy. I spent most of my career as a sysadmin. I spent a lot of time in data centers, racking and stacking and wiring and running Linux servers and doing configuration management and all of that. And then when I came to AWS, uh, initially, I spent a number of years talking about uh, what I'll now call classic cloud infrastructure. I used to go to companies and I would talk about VPCs and availability zones and subnets and how you take this and then you need to add in things like internet gateways and NAT gateways and load balancers. And then you have to add in things like auto scaling and then you have to add in things like databases, and then you have your instances, and you'd have a couple more instances, and then eventually maybe you'd get a lot of instances. And this is talking strictly about backend technologies, right? This is the infrastructure side of things. This is the nuts and bolts that I spend most of my career spending time on. Uh, and then most of the people that I was talking with spent time on. Now, if we're going to talk about full stack, we're typically talking about a front end and a back end. And you know what? The front end world is, is something that is completely, completely different and opaque to me. I can't say that I entirely understand all of the front end concepts because that's not typically what I've been schooled in. Um, and so essentially, when I think about this concept around what full stack means. Again, it's this mastery of these two parts where to me, just mastering one of those parts becomes really difficult to keep on top with and, and to follow along with. So again, coming back to this concept of full stack, what are, we, what are we talking about? Well, we're talking about basically a number of different technologies. We have front end technologies, we have back end technologies. We have uh, all of the security and performance and other related things that one might want to have in here. I want to make sure that people see me. OK, good. OK, great. Um, and so all of this is, again, a lot of stuff, right? If we think about all of these components here, plus you think about front end technologies, all of that JavaScript and CSS and HTML and all of those other bits, this is a lot of stuff to say that you could full stack, right? How are you ever going to be able to combine all of this into one thing? So this is where some of my disbelief in this term has come with, uh, come from. And in conversations that I've had with AWS customers about them trying to build full stack teams and where they want to invest their, their time and their people and their money uh, is again, this is a lot of complexity. There's a lot of components to this. Um, but let's say that we wanted to get towards this, right? What, what could you do to drive towards what it means to be a full stack company, a full stack team, 
uh, you know, this model of full stack across the board. And so what really you're looking at then becomes a reduction exercise, right? So what are we doing at the core of the work that we all do? Well, a lot of it is writing software and running infrastructure. And so we write that software that is on that client side or that is in backend or internal microservices or processing data. And on that infrastructure side, it's all that other nuts and bolts stuff, right? It's that crazy complex diagram of subnets and uh, availability zones and VPC components and auto scaling and databases and all of that. And then the security and everything else that's on top of that. And so we start having to think to ourselves, well, what can we do to minimize this, right? Well, we could write less code. And I would argue that, uh, again, if we look at some of the really exciting cutting edge front end frameworks, uh, the stuff that's going on in the JavaScript world uh, over the last couple of years, people are writing less code, right? If you're building React or Vue or Angular based websites uh, and mobile apps with any of the layers that go on top of that, uh, things like Gatsby, things like Next.js, you, you are writing code. Again, I am far too, uh, let's say, um, uh, ignorant and untrained in front end technologies to go into as much depth with them as I wish that I could. Can we manage less infrastructure? Well, really, the only way that we can really manage less infrastructure is if we're willing to trust and manage services. And so if we go back and look at what we've done at Amazon, which led to us building AWS, Really, the genealogy of this was us saying, well, you know what? We can build managed services that are good enough to replace what individual teams did. Uh, and then based on just kind of economies of scale, we can make them better, faster, cheaper, uh, more featureful over time. And so this does actually bring us back to Lambda to a degree, right? And it brings us back to six years ago when Werner stood on a stage at reInvent in Las Vegas and talked about how no server is easier to manage than no server. And this is one of those Werner quotes that uh, we love to use and, and, and tout kind of all over the place. Uh, and again, if we go back to that first announcement post that uh, we had with Werner, uh, and we highlight just kind of the core text of this, right? This is getting at that core of what serverless really kind of was. It was removing the operations, it was removing all of the uh, bits and pieces for managing those servers and configuring that infrastructure, patch management, you know, a whole bunch of things that you used to have to do. This didn't necessarily reduce the front end side, uh, but again, from that back end side, it takes, it takes things and simplifies it pretty far. So again, six years ago when we launched, we had things like S3, uh, which had launched way earlier at AWS, and you could put objects into an S3 bucket, and now you can configure Lambda, consume it, process that data, and this was massively way simpler and easy, co easier compared to what we had in the past. Similarly with Kinesis data streams, uh, you can ingest all this data in near real time to Kinesis, put Lambda behind it, process it. Wow, this is so much easier than what we used to have. But then eventually in the summer of 2015, we launched API Gateway. And then all of a sudden, I think this was the real aha moment for a lot of people. Oh, wait a second, I can use this to power APIs. And we see APIs being basically the kind of main contract or construct for how people build technologies that have to face other ones. So whether you're talking about mobile apps or web-based apps or interactive apps or device-based apps um, or you know, devices, uh, or you're talking about internal microservices, powering things with APIs has been the way that we've kind of made the industry build software for at least the last decade. So this gets really powerful. Uh, and again, this fits into this mantra of serverless, not running infrastructure, not worrying about scale, pay for what you use, all of kind of the goodies that come with that. And so now this is only kind of part of the stack, right? How do we then take these benefits, take this idea, take this philosophy and extend it further across all the things that we might want to do in this space, right? How do we end up at full stack serverless, which is what Nader's put here on the cover of this book? And so this is an example uh, of an architecture that I have been talking about now for maybe the last two or so years, I think, since Amplify Console first launched. Um, and this is a full stack serverless application. Uh, again, what we have here is we have our, our front end or mobile web app hosting with Amplify Console. We have user management that could be done with Amazon Cognito. And then we have our backend stacks, so API Gateway, Lambda, DynamoDB. 
Uh, and it's not just Dynamo now, right? We have a number of different databases, database types that kind of fit this serverless-ish model that exists. And so again, what we've done is taken some aspect of, of this crazy complicated architecture and we've greatly simplified it into this thing. But what I think I've found to be really exciting in the industry in the last couple of years is we've asked ourselves, you know, can we take this further? Can we make this even easier than it is now? And we've seen a lot of the tooling frameworks that do this. And so Jeremy talked a little bit about this before in his intro, uh, things like serverless framework, things like Pulumi and CDK, things like uh, what we see companies like Stackery doing, a number of other companies that have taken this architecture and made it even easier. Personally, I'm really excited about two companies that I see pushing the, the edges of, of where the space is going to go, which is Netlify and Vercel. Uh, and, and they both do similar-ish things, if, if hopefully they don't mind me saying that about them. Um, and these are really cool companies. These are cool technologies. And these are things, uh, or these are products that, frankly, can do a whole lot for you without you having to do a whole lot. And to me, that's always kind of been this idea of serverless is, it's not just that you don't have infrastructure to manage, it's that you should be doing less to get the same outcome, right? The outcome is building your business applications, serving your customers, uh, and again, doing that with less, ideally paying less, ideally having to manage less, um, and how much lessness you can make that, um, that is what we continue to strive for. And really when we come now to 2020, uh, and, and again, Jeremy talked a little bit about this before, there's a vast scope of workloads mm. that can run inside of uh, inside of this model. Uh, so whether it be you know what we call interactive apps, web and mobile, backends, event processing, streaming data, batch processing, internal tools, this is a lot of what software developers are doing across all of the you know software development industry today. And so we really see this future where serverless can exist, and again, where you're not running infrastructure. Uh, at all, right? You're not managing virtual machines or physical machines. You're not running uh, container orchestration. Um, you're not dealing with anything that looks like that level of taking things on, right? Opinionatedness. So these services do have balance. They do have limits. They do have working models. Uh, and you might have to change how you build software to fit that. The, the trade-off is that you get all the benefits, right? And so the benefits of, again, pay for what you use, the way that pricing works on these, the fact that the majority of people who build serverless apps end up saving money compared to what you might be doing otherwise. And again, we say the vast majority, that means not all of them. Uh, and where some of these technologies, some of these higher level things like uh, what the Amplify collection of services can do for you at AWS, um, what uh, a Netlify or a Vercel can do for you. You know, maybe that covers about 80% of what your business needs. And then maybe there's about 19% of what else your business needs where you're going to have to do a little bit of hand cobbling of some of these components. Um, and we have to be real, right? That's configuration overhead. That's uh, having to have knowledge of how these components work. But you're still going to get overwhelmingly the benefits of them. Again, while still doing potentially less than you would have done in a traditional uh, architecture infrastructure mindset. And so what about that? The, what about the 1%, right? We've got to care about the 1%. Um, and, and this is a polite jab to the folks at Berkeley who have written a couple of, of white papers and documents over the last couple of years, uh, you know, talking about, hey, Lambda is not ready for high performance, you know, sub nanosecond computing and shared memory and all these other things. That's not what the industry is building. That's not what most of us are writing software for. Again, if we talk about those workloads that I was highlighting before, that's overwhelmingly what we see people building. So I am totally fine with saying that Lambda is not appropriate for uh, all of the HPC workloads that might exist out there today, uh, or high frequency trading, or certain other workloads that really push the extends and bounds of computing infrastructure. And that's why here at AWS, we have things like crazy huge instances that have tens of cores and tens of gigabytes of memory and SSDs and all this crazy stuff. Um, but the reality is most people just don't need it. So we're getting to that point where, you know, again, we put all this together and you've got some edge cases and some things that you might need. So you're kind of almost full stack serverless. But we know that this is not everything, right? There are some parts to all of this technology that isn't great yet. Um, there are rough edges that need to be sanded down. There are things that we need to 
uh, make easier for both the developer side of the house and the operator side of the house and security and all of that. So uh, let me get to the, the second part of the title of my talk here. Uh, recently, I, I had an EC2 instance that was up and I thought to myself, you know what, let me just pull up the last time I ran SSH. And what was crazy was I had switched uh, work laptops maybe about nine months prior, uh, literally about nine months. And I came to find that I had not run SSH on my work laptop pretty much at all. Um, now, yes, it's plausible that bash history only goes back so far, um, but basically I had no recent uh, executions of SSH. Now I'm a former sysadmin. I've been doing Linux for well over 20 years now. Um, I like, whoa, what does this mean for me uh, at this point to say that I have not run SSH in months and months and months and months? And again, polite jab at the term no ops here. Um, so why do we run SSH, right? SSH is one of these tools that developers know, that operators know, that all sorts of people know. It's got a lot of useful th use cases for it, right? We use it to uh, install software, to configure hosts, to do operability things, to check logs and processes that are running and run debug commands and all of this kind of stuff. And so that's important stuff, right? SSH is something that we would uh, expect that people would normally use. But if we come to this world of serverless, I can't SSH into a Lambda function. Now I'll caveat that with some creative people have figured out ways to SSH into a Lambda function. However, you don't use it for configuration or troubleshooting or any of those other things. And really, I can't SSH into any of the serverless services. And again, this is kind of by design. Um, and so how do we then handle the use cases of things that we would want to with that? Uh, and again, this is something that has been uh, a place that many in the industry have been chasing after. And AWS has had credible partners in this space that have helped you be able to do things like get monitoring and logging and observability information, security tools. Uh, thankfully, Jeremy gave a quick rundown on this. And so again, one of the big things about serverless, and I've talked about this at a number of the serverless days events in the past, is that there's three key things that uh, happen with serverless um, that drive it forward. One are the things that as a serverless provider of technologies and services for you that we do behind the scenes that you don't see. So believe it or not, Lambda, API Gateway, DynamoDB, Kinesis, et cetera, they've all gotten many, many times faster than, you've, uh, than they were when they launched. And you don't see that. You just wake up and you get the benefits of it. We don't even always share all of those things that have happened. The second are the things that we do that we announce, but that you don't have to take an, act, uh, take an action on. So for example, last year in 2019, we announced uh, new networking for Lambda functions and VPC. And essentially for almost all customers, you just sat there and it got better for you. But we exposed the fact that it was a little bit different. And then the third column are things that we give you that you have to take an action on. And so, for example, last year at reInvent 2019, we announced provision concurrency. And so provision concurrency is essentially a knob that you turn, but it basically gets rid of cold starts for you. It essentially allows you to pre-provision Lambda infrastructure behind the scenes so that the uh, overall performance curve of your Lambda functions uh, out through the high percentiles looks almost flat. Um, and it gives you a better experience to your customers. But when it comes to things like SSH and being able to install all these things, this was not something yet that was solved. So did we give you SSH? Not exactly. Uh, but just about two weeks ago, we did announce something called uh, AWS Lambda Extensions. Now, Extensions is pretty cool. Uh, what it allows you to do is to extend the Lambda runtime environment. It allows you to basically plug into what you had uh, before your Lambda functions and your infrastructure and be able to pull data out of that or to modify how things run or to change some aspect about how things exist. Uh, and really the idea here was not to make you have to SSH in and install a client and configure a client and do a bunch of stuff like that, but instead basically let you just drop this extension into your environment, uh, drop in configuration, say via environment variables and you know allow you to be successful with this. And so, uh, again, basically, this extensions uh, product capability builds upon something called an extensions API. Again, the importance of APIs and how we operate things. 
which sits parallel to the runtime API. Uh, now, the runtime API allows you to bring almost any language to Lambda today. Uh, it was interesting to see in the uh, in the blog post about how the serverless installed. They called out lack of runtime support. Uh, we've had this since 2018. It's pretty easy to find. Um, so Runtime API allows you to bring almost any language to Lambda that you could think of. Now, the Extensions API allows you to plug into the Lambda environment in the ways that you would traditionally want to. There's two different models for it. There's what we have called internal and external extensions. They operate similarly. Uh, however, one is basically in process with your code, and the other one sits uh, kind of on the, the outside of your running environment, uh, inside of the execution environment, but outside of your code. It also allowed us uh, to launch some capabilities around extending what's called the life cycle of a Lambda function. Um, and so we now have a number of places where you can hook into a Lambda function. It's much more than just shutdown, um, well, which uh, there are some other serverless technologies that support now. Uh, this gives you, in the beginning, uh, it gives you a couple different places. Again, it gives you places in your code. It gives you places in the environment to plug in. So there's a lot that becomes possible with this. And then awesomely enough, we managed to have a bunch of incredible partners in the AWS ecosystem that have already launched extensions. Um, and you know, many of these are, are names of companies that you know and that you probably utilize their technologies today. And so again, you would have previously SSH'd in uh, or used a configuration management tool, a chef or a puppet, what have you, to do things like install Datadog agents or New Relic agents or uh, any of the number of other things that you see here. Configure Vault, for example, from HashiCorp. Uh, and now this is much easier. And it's much better, and again, without SSH. So uh, you know, as a, uh, a serverless developer and a consumer of these technologies, much like myself, you may find yourself just not SSHing anymore. I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. So to be clear though, this is not no ops. Uh, and, and to be really, really clear from the AWS side of things, we don't use that term, right? We recognize and understand that there are places where you're still gonna have to do some of the things that you used to do. No, none of you are going to be going into data centers and racking and stacking your serverless infrastructure. Uh, and I hate to tell you, if anyone is saying that you are installing serverless infrastructure, you, you probably want to look for a different place of employment because it, it, it's not real. Um, but again, there are these challenges. And so extensions gets us part of the way. Uh, the other part of the way is the tools that you build and you run and that our partners build and run on your behalf and that can plug into these, these places. Uh, and again, while a lot of this stuff is black box, it's not going to give you, uh, and, and now we have extensions, we still have some of those black box kind of dark corners that we have to expose in different ways. Uh, Jeremy mentioned X-Ray, uh, you know, there are capabilities around things like CloudWatch and AWS. Again, whether you're on Microsoft or you're in GCP or a number of other places, you have a lot of those other options out there. So observability remains key. I think as an industry, we all need to get a lot better at what observability is, how to be good at it, uh, what kind of tools you need and how to, you know, interoperate those inside of your, your infrastructure. Um, performance still becomes a big challenge. So this is a big change again, going from this world where you could log into infrastructure and you could sit there and run commands like top and much more advanced tools like that. Uh, and again, this is where a lot of these partner tools, this is where things like X-Ray become valuable. And then Jeremy touched on this, and, and this is one that uh, personally I've wanted to spend more time talking about, which is security. You know, I find by and large in a lot of these serverless uh, days events and a lot of talks that I see people doing about serverless, we're not spending enough time talking and focusing on security. And there's a lot that goes into it. There's a lot of controls. Uh, yes, things like IAM remain complicated. Um, it's, you know, incredibly powerful technologies. Um, but, you know, with that power comes responsibility. And so I'm hoping that in 2021, we start seeing a lot more people talking about serverless security. So where do we end up? Well, we're kind of almost full stack serverless with some things that we have to think about. And so again, I think if you look at uh, Nader's book and uh, you look at what people are talking about when they talk about full stack serverless, it's incredibly powerful the things that you can do today. Again, small asterisks that there are a lot of things that we need to get better at. Kind of closing here, we should again celebrate that serverless is now six years old, uh, that we have this incredible community, that we have this industry of partner and players and people that are here. 
Uh, I foresee us celebrating seven and eight and nine and 10 and many other birthdays of serverless here in the future. Uh, the last thing I'll, I'll kind of uh, promote out here is a site that my team has recently launched called Serverless Land. We're in the really early days of this, but we're really looking to make this be a hub of place where you could find uh, both AWS information and then community information and partner information uh, and really boil down all of this stuff that's out there. Uh, so a lot more that my team uh, is going to be doing here, but check it out, send us some feedback. And then again, uh, please feel free to reach out. So again, this is uh, Chris Munns from AWS. You can find me at munns at amazon.com uh, or at Chris Munns on Twitter. And uh, always happy to have uh, a robust conversation with you in one of those places. So thanks again for having me. Uh, I'm going to drop back into camera mode here and, uh, and uh, have, uh, I guess, some conversations. All right. Well, I don't see you yet, but I'm sure you'll be up there. But anyways, before we jump into the Q&A, just thank you, Chris. That was an awesome talk. Um, sounds like we should have collaborated beforehand. Um, I, I took some of your talking points there. I apologize for that. Um, so super interesting talk because I, I, you know, and, and, and I'm really happy you went down this path of this full stack serverless thing because this is really interesting to me and I think it's interesting to others. And one of my things right from the beginning of serverless was how easy it was to code something without worrying about cloud infrastructure. Um, and you have a lot of people who maybe know some front end JavaScript, can kind of do some things like that and can can build really nice applications, um, but then lack the ability to either have them scale or give them some interactivity. So. <clears throat> What do you think the next step is? I mean, with Vercel and with Netlify, um, you know, building out serverless functions as part of what they do, uh, with mm -hmm. more of these global data stores, I think we're going to start to see. Um, and then even with what Amplify is doing, because Amplify framework, not to get confused with the Amplify console, which is also sort of like a Vercel um, Netlify sort of component. Like, where do where do you see this this going? Is this going to be something where you know maybe AWS is going to invest in more tools to to make it easier? Well, I know that you know that I can't talk about AWS roadmap here today. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, right. But, uh, you know, I've been following along loosely with uh, things like Gatsby and Next.js. And I look at uh, and, and some of the things that are, you know, built around those spaces. There's a bunch of these uh, kind of next age, new age like CMSs uh, and other tools. They're incredibly powerful. Um, uh, from a person who first started hacking around with like PHP and MySQL in like 2000, maybe, uh, and, and doing really horrible CSS and HTML and a little bit of JavaScript. When you look at, and then also someone who was like really impressed mm -hmm. by Twitter Bootstrap. Uh, so back when the Twitter folks were just like, hey, here's this CSS grid thing. And um, that led to, you know, a million really ugly sysadmin tools as all of us sysadmin ops, DevOps people started building them. So I, I see a really strong future there. Uh, again, regardless of where you're hosting those things, I think that they will become more and more key in the industry. Uh, and so for people developing front end mobile client type stuff, that becomes really, 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 um, really, really key, I think, as we go forward here. You know, you hit the nail on the head about managed databases. Uh, whether it's stuff like Fauna or some of the things that we see that we're doing with um, you know, DynamoDB global tables, uh, some of the capabilities that exist around there, that stuff is going to lead to you know, even faster, even more robust, stronger applications. And you get that with a couple clicks. Um, I remember reading years ago about how Facebook had to make MySQL work between the East Coast and the West Coast. And this was like circa 2009, 2010. Uh, and at the time, I was working for uh, Etsy, which was a pretty uh, was a fun place to work, e-commerce shop. And just that, like, oh my God, running databases across the country—that's that's magical sorcery type things. Now you can do it with a couple clicks. Right. So as this stuff becomes more prevalent, as it becomes uh, you know even easier, and then I think as the tooling just obfuscates it all, you know, having a tool out there that you write the word global colon yes, and then all of a sudden, all of this stuff happens behind the scenes. Um, that's really, really powerful. Yeah, I think we see in the SaaS space, uh, you know, companies like Segment, which was recently acquired by Twilio, uh, and Twilio, right? Two companies, awesome, awesome SaaS companies, great powers of great powerful things you could do with them. I think we'll see more and more of that stuff get pushed up to that layer. Uh, and, and again, 
people can get started building those companies easier than ever with serverless technologies. Right. We've had a few people ask if you could give us a demo of your CSS skills, but I don't think we have time, so we'll have to save it for uh, another really time. Um, <laughs> um, so uh, another thing you mentioned, you mentioned that Berkeley paper, and this was one of those mm -hmm. things where I think everybody in the serverless space was like, oh, right, yes, we get it. Berkeley, like, you're right on, you know, that the, the, the future is serverless, and yeah, there's a few, uh, you know, a few weak spots, whatever. Um, but I really like what you said in your talk about how the majority of applications of the things that serverless can't do right now, the majority of applications don't need that, right? And so yeah. there's so much you can do with it now. Um, and you keep, and so again, basically your idea was saying, you know, look, you can use these tools and you can keep writing less and less code. You can keep doing less because these other services will do it for you. So what about containers? Because this is something with Fargate and with uh, Cloud Run um, and some of these other things where we've seen people, and I don't know if it's because they just want to have a more of a sense of control or they really need that sense of control, but whether it's with Lambda layers or whether it's with extensions now and some of these other things, um, having more control over the execution environment, is that something you see um, as a necessity or is that something that you see as sort of going to be for more of those edge cases? Um. Good question. I think it's definitely a little bit of both. So when I look at extensions, uh, extensions, frankly, for us was an evolution of what Lambda Layers was meant to be. So I, mm -hmm. I, I've been in the Lambda organization long enough to know when we first kind of wrote the initial document around layers, it was also essentially extensions. And since we first launched Lambda, we had a lot of customers saying to us, yeah, but I really want to be able to drop in these tools. I want to drop in these agents. I want to have this uh, kind of uniformity across the tooling that I use. And so I think that's a very powerful thing that people see. When I look at where people have adopted containers and why they like, they've liked that, one of the big things that's that's been uh, powerful, I should say, with uh, containers over something like Lambda is that you don't have to change your programming model. So your programming model of just being kind of port and socket based comes with it. And whereas when you make that change to Lambda, uh, you're going from that port and socket model to the event-based model. Now, we happen to find that changing to the event-based model brings with a lot of benefits uh, around economies of scale, around the ability to do fine-grained security, around really kind of the, the size and shape of a Lambda function versus the size and shape of a container. But I think now that we've kind of leveled the bar insofar as uh, what extensions offers up for those who say, ah, I really need to be able to poke at this. I need to be able to run these tools that I have. Um, that's one kind of less, uh, one less blocker towards being able to easily adopt Lambda. And for those of you that are already running Lambda, being able to bring in these incredibly powerful tools from our partners across the industry is just like ugh, awesome stuff that you can do with them now. Uh, and it's been really exciting to see what the initial launch partners had in store uh, with their capabilities. So I, I see it as um, you know helping to meet our developer customers where they are, where they want to be. Um, I still see the socket port model versus the event model now being the next kind of biggest thing of how do we convince people that there are those benefits there that we see. Um, and that I think is probably the last kind of big, uh, big bridge to build in, in this space. Awesome. All right, last question. Um, and this is not leaking any roadmap. Just ha people want to know how many Lambda feature or serverless features are we going to hear announced at reInvent this year? Oh boy. Um, uh, let me put it this way. Um, I have a lot of meetings uh, about a lot of things happening in the next couple of weeks every, every day. So uh, I think that... Um, okay. You know, again, we keep working on things. Extensions was a big one for us this year, but uh, I think we still got some fun stuff in store for reInvent. Awesome. All right, Chris, thank you again, everybody. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be back on in just a few minutes um, with our, our with our next talk. Thanks. Thanks again, Chris. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for having me. Cheers.
Welcome back, everyone. I hope you had a quick break. And thanks again to Chris Munns for that excellent talk. Uh, a lot of exciting stuff happening and uh, and hopefully a lot of announcements from reInvent. Um, but of course, from the other clouds as well, it's interesting what everyone is doing with, uh, with serverless and how that whole thing is just moving forward. So we have another excellent talk coming up for you. Susanna Kaiser uh, is going to be talking about designing serverless applications using domain-driven design. Uh, this is a fascinating topic, uh, super interesting, mix of Wardley maps and all kinds of cool stuff like that. So uh, here is Susanna Kaiser. Thanks a lot for attending this talk, designing a serverless application with domain-driven design. 2 trillion, 840 billion US dollars. That is the estimated amount poor software quality was costing uh, the US economy in 2018, according to a research study by the Consortium of IT Software Quality, CISQ. So in summary, poor software quality is enormously expensive. And there are no simple measures for bad or good software qualities, but several metrics can be used as indicators. For instance, an increasing curve of um, a defect trend over time or low test coverage, cyclomatic complexity or significant, uh, significant deaths of inheritance and a high degree of class coupling are potential indicators of subpar code. The amount of effort it takes to understand a piece of code or poorly engineered software resulting from, for example, um, immature, undisciplined practices or other po um, possible indicators. And the lack of domain knowledge and communication and coordination issues in teams can also represent indicators of poor software quality. In this context of software quality, I would like to talk about domain-driven design, um, a development philosophy defined by Eric Evans. And uh, domain-driven design comes with a core statement, in order to build better software, we have to align its software design with the business domain, the business needs, and the business strategy. But domain-driven design comes with a lot of new terms and that requires some time to grasp and to understand. So when starting the journey to domain-driven design can be quite overwhelming. And today in this talk, I would like to visualize the, the journey to domain-driven design with Wortley Maps. So what are Wadley maps? Simon Wadley, a researcher from the UK, has created this technique. Uh, a Wadley map is a representation of the landscape in which a business is operating in and visualizes the evolution of a value chain. So what is the value chain? So behind every user need is a value chain. It starts off with the first question, who are your users? Who is expecting something from you or asking for help? And what are your users needs? What kind of problem they would like to get solved by you? So, and the user needs are potentially the anchor of the map. And what are the components and in activities that are necessary to fulfill the user needs directly or indirectly by facilitating other activities? And how do these components depend on each other and what position do they have in the value chain? So at the top, we have those things that are visible um, where users are touching your system. And at the bottom, it's getting more and more invisible for the user. Now, each component of the value chain is going to be plotted along an evolution axis going from left to right. At le the left, we have um, Genesis with brand new things that have never existed before, then custom build, then product and rental, such as um, off the shelf products or open source software, and then things on the right like commodity and utilities. And the movement of a component along the X axis is determined by its stage of evolution. Wadley maps come with some patterns and some principles. And let's start with some of the patterns first. And one pattern is that the map is never static, but very dynamic. So everything evolves from left to right through the forces of supply and demand competition. And as the component evolves, their characteristic change from, from an uncharted domain on the left, the uncertain, rare, and constantly changing domain, becoming more and more industrialized when moving to the right, um, uh, to, the, to the known, the common, the stable domain on, on, the, on the very right. And some of the principles is that you should um, use appropriate methods per um, evolution stage. Um, so the Evolution stage has helped you to identify what components to build in-house, where to use or buy off-the-shelf products or use open source software, and what components to outsource to utility suppliers. 
And when your map shows that you're custom building commodities, that's a strong indicator for investing on the wrong parts of your system. And instead, you should outsource these parts to utility suppliers. Another principle is that it's um, very important to know who your users are, for example, customers, shareholders, and so on, and focus on their user needs. And the user needs, they are the subject area for what we build software. They are the, the why, the purpose of our business domain, and they are the anchor of our map. Before we develop a solution that solves the user needs, we have to understand the problem domain first. And uh, the lack of domain knowledge could result in poor software quality, as mentioned in the beginning. And that's where domain-driven design comes in, where the collaboration between the domain experts and the development teams is an essential part to obtain domain knowledge, and uh, which is described in terms of the shared language, the ubiquitous language. Domain-driven domain -driven design comes with patterns and practices as well. So they are composed of strategic and tactical um, patterns and practices. And when we enter the field of strategic design and tactical design, I would like to combine it with Wardley maps and use um, the y-axis to plot the position in the value chain. Going from top, the strategic design, the strategic design patterns to further down to the tactical design patterns. So we start in the problem space of strategic design. That's where we analyze the problem domain or business domain and discover its sub and subdomains. As a next step, we go further down and switch to the solution space of strategic design. That's where we um, do high level um, design decisions and decompose our system into modular, modular components, the uh, bounded context and map their interactions patterns between them, the context maps. Further down, we enter the tactical design patterns that support um, lower level design decisions to architect an implementation that fits the problem domain as closely as possible and that provides building blocks to implement the domain model. And when distilling the problem domain, we are partitioning the problem domain into small subdomains and a set of interrelated use cases or business processes. And by partitioning the problem domain into smaller subdomains, we are reducing complexity but not all subdomains are equal. Some are more valuable to the business domain than others. So we have different types of subdomain, the core, supporting, and generic subdomains. The core subdomain, that is the, the essential part of our problem domain, providing competitive advantage. That are those parts of the system that make it success and should be hard for competitors to copy or imitate and supposed to be quite complex and tend to change often. That's the core domain. That's the one that we have to strategically invest most and innovate on. And that's the subdomain we need to build in-house and um, supposed to go into the genesis and custom build evolution stage. The supporting subdomain, on the other hand, helps to support the core subdomain. Um, but they do not provide any competitive advantage. They are quite simple, they do not change often, and um, if possible, we should look out for buying off-the-shelf products or use open source software that goes then in the product and rental evolution stage. If that's not possible for the um, uh, supporting subdomain, and uh, if, we, if we have to custom build the supporting subdomain, we should not invest heavily in that part of the system. Generic subdomain, that are the subdomains that many large businesses, uh, business systems have, um, for example, um, authentication or payment services, and they aren't core and they do not provide um, a competitive advantage, but um, usually businesses cannot work without them. They are generally complex, but already solved by someone else. And for those um, components of the generic subdomain, we should focus on buying off the shelf products or, open, or use open source software or outsource to commodity suppliers. So uh, in this part of the system, there is no need for innovation here. When going further down, we are switching to the solution space of strategic de design, where we decompose our system into modular components, the bounded context that forms a boundary around a domain model. Let's look first at domain models before we go into bounded context. So within each subdomain, a domain model can be created representing the domain logic and business rules that are relevant to that area of the system. And the domain model can come in different shapes. Um, the domain model is, uh, in the beginning, is formed first as an analysis model during the collaboration between the domain experts and the development teams. And 
can result later in a code model. And what is very important is that the domain model is uh, described in terms of the ubiquitous language and is free of any technical complexities. A domain model cannot exist uh, without a boundary, and that's where we come to the bounded context. And a bounded context forms different types of boundaries. A bounded context forms, for example, a consistency boundary around the domain model and protects its integrity. A bounded context also forms a linguistic and semantic boundary um, so that the language's um, um, terms are only consistent inside its bounded context. It also serves as ownership boundaries. For example, bounded context could be implemented, evolved, and maintained by one team only. However, um, a single team can own multiple um, um, bounded contexts, um, on the other hand. And um, bounded contexts also serve as a physical boundary and can be implemented as separate solutions and shall, yeah, uh, separate solu solutions. And not all bounded contexts need to share the uh, same architecture patterns. They could differ for, um, for every bounded context. And also um, the business logic implementation patterns can differ from context to context. The bounded contexts are, um, uh, represent good candidates for microservices and could also be very helpful to, for structuring, structuring and organizing your serverless application, which I will address a little later. So let's create an example. Um, let's design a software as a service solution, a conference solution that helps organizers of a confer conference to manage the call for papers. And um, what kind of users do are we targeting? So we have on the one side, the conference organizers, and on the other side, the speakers. And what kind of user need that they have? So the organizer um, would like to start um, a call for paper, a CFP, and would like to manage a conference event. And uh, the, the speaker itself would like to submit a session to this call for paper. Uh, at, the, um, at the end of the submission period, the um, organizer would like to evaluate the submitted sessions and uh, would like to, to build and publish a schedule of the accepted sessions. Also during uh, the CFP or during the preparation of the conference, the organizers would like to communicate with the speakers. And um, also, we would like to sign up and sign into that conference solutions, uh, solution as well. As a next step, we are going to decompose the problem domain into smaller subdomains and uh, discover the core domain. Um, for example, um, based on a vision statement and collaborating with the stakeholders. And the core domain is strategically very important, and that's where we should invest and innovate in. After analyzing the business domain and discovering the subdomains, um, we had some knowledge crunching sessions with the domain experts and we were able to gain some domain knowledge and derive our first domain models of our subdomains. Uh, these domain models represent at this stage, um, at this state, um, the, the analysis model that could be UML diagrams or um, product sketches, wireframes and so on. And what's important is that they are free of technical concern and they are described in our shared language, the ubiquitous language. <clears throat> so we noticed um, at this date uh, that we derived some domain models that are used um, at different places of our system. So we have sessions, speakers, and CFP call for papers that relate to multiple domain models. But um, a session proposal that has been submitting, submitted during the call for paper has different attributes and rules than a session that has been scheduled for the agenda, for the agenda or for the schedule. So for the agenda or schedule, time slot and uh, rooms are relevant, and we have to make sure that we are not scheduled um, a session twice. But um, room and time slot and the check of potentially um, double scheduling a sc session is not relevant um, for uh, the session submission, neither for the session evaluation. To keep the consistency and integrity of our domain models, we have to adjust our ubiquitous language, our shared language. And we are now talking of submitted sessions, scheduled sessions, and eval evaluated sessions. And this is a strong indicator that we need to place a boundary around our models, the bounded context, to keep the meaning of our models consistent and clear. And uh, these bounded contexts form a linguistic and semantic boundary and protects the integrity of our models. And as mentioned earlier, our bounded contexts enable also ownership boundaries, and one bounded context should be owned by one team only, but one team can own several bounded contexts. 
And uh, this enables autonomous teams working at their own bonded context um, independently at their own pace with minimal impact across other teams. Bounded context also serves as, uh, serve as physical boundaries, so they can be implemented as separate solutions and can be deployed independently as separate artifacts. And um, it also enables, um, the bounded context also enables to have separate data stores, which are not access accessible by other bounded contexts. And the source code of each bounded context can be maintained in separate Git repositories with their own CI CD pipeline. And each bounded context can have separate architecture patterns applied. And that's where we enter the tactical design area of domain-driven design. For example, one bounded context can, can go with the layered architecture, we, where we split our source code into layers such as presentation, business logic, and persistence layer, or as a hexagonal architecture, a specific form of the layered architecture, um, which is also call, called uh, ports and adapters and aims for um, separation of concerns and creating loosely coupled software components that can be easily connected to the software environment by using ports and adapters. Or we can use CQRS, um, uh, Command Query Responsibility Segregation. And uh, in this uh, pattern, we are, this enables us to use different models to, to um, update information, to write information, and to read information. Uh, let's go a little bit more into detail about the hexagonal architecture. Um, as I mentioned, it's also called ports and adapters and aims for separation of concern and creating loosely coupled software components that can be easily connected to the software environment by using ports and adapters. And this makes um, the components, ex uh, components exchangeable and facilitate test awesome automation. And external architecture categorizes your software components into an outer and inner part where ports and adapters are used to connect from the outside to the inner part and also from the inner part to the outside. Let's look at uh, the business logic implementation patterns. Um, as mentioned earlier, each bounded context can be implemented differently, for example, as a domain model with its building blocks. Um, of aggregates, entities, and so on. I will come to this one in a minute. And um, the domain model itself copes with cases of complex business logic and business rules. And it's very well suited for implementing the core subdomain where we are dealing with complex business logic. Or uh, bonded context can be also implemented as active records. Um, active records represent a row in a database table or view and encapsulate the database access and adds domain logic to that data. So it carries both um, the data behavior and the access to the um, to the database itself. And the active record supports cases where um, business logic is quite simple, but operate on more complex data structures. And it's um, very usable for the supporting subdomain in, in case we have to custom build the supporting subdomain. Or in transaction script on the other side, other side is organizing business logic by um, procedures where each procedure um, handles a single request from, from the presentation. And transaction script works very well for a small application that doesn't implement any complex logic. So when going into the building blocks of domain models, um, then we are uh, talking about value objects, entities, aggregates, repository, application service, and domain events. And as, as I said earlier, domain models cups with cases of complex business logic with complicated business rule. Uh, so the value object in itself can be identified by its values and are immutable. So um, changing the value of a value object will lead to a new object instance. It will be replaced. An entity on the other side uh, can be identified by its unique ID and its state can change over, over the time. And an aggregate is uh, composed of entities and uh, value object and represent a hierarchy of objects and draws a clear um, consistency boundary and can act as a transactional boundary where one entity is called the aggregate root, um, which, I come, which I will describe a little later. <clears throat> and um, the repository, that's the one that um, is responsible for saving and retrieving entities or aggregates um, to or from the underlying, underlying storage mechanism. And the application service, um, they only orchestrate use cases and manage transactions, so they do not contain any, any business logic. 
the domain itself, uh, the main event is, uh, itself is a message um, that described a significant event uh, that has happened in, in the business domain. And when we look at an example of, um, of our bounded context um, uh, event management, where we deal with the domain model um, um, event, and then an example of how to compose our um, domain model um, with entities and, and value objects. So in this case, um, um, the event aggregate is composed of the event um, entity identified by its unique ID event ID and, and other immutable value object, objects for name, status, description, and period. And the um, event entity serves as an aggregate root and is, uh, the aggregate root is designated as um, the aggregate's public interface. So all its methods itself are, um, are um, considered as the uh, method of the aggregate's public interface. And the event aggregate draws a clear consistency boundary and acts as a transaction, um, transactional boundary. So now the question is, how can we um, build a serverless application using domain-driven design and hexagonal architecture? Um, let's say we would like to build a backend API with serverless for our event management bounded context using AWS components. We could start uh, first with the outer and outside part of our hexagonal architecture, and we would like to provide REST endpoints that are exposed by an AWS API gateway. And when calling a REST endpoint from the client, uh, the API gateway triggers an AWS Lambda function. And uh, the implementation of AWS Lambda functions is done in the event controller. The event controller is the adapter for the incoming requests on the events endpoint. And um, the events controller uses the port to connect to the application service to connect to the inner part. So how does it look like in code? This is a sample code extract um, of the events controller written and, and implemented in TypeScript that has implemented several Lambda functions. And we would like to focus on publishing uh, conference events. And uh, the event controller receives the requests through the Lambda functions parameters, in this case, an API gateway event, parses the request and checks whether the request is syntactically correct. For example, if the request contained the ID in the path. If uh, the request is syntactically correct, we proceed and pass the request down to the inside by executing the application service publish method. The events controller uses the event application service as port to connect to the inner part. Uh, the event application service is a gateway to your domain model and, and the hexagonal architecture considered as a port to the inner part. And the event application service, that's the one that orchestrates um, use cases managing transactions and do not contain any business logic. It's, it's itself the client of the event domain model, which contains then the, uh, the business logic and checking the invariance. So, um, the, what the event application service does is that it loads the aggregate, um, the event aggregate from the database by the ID and uh, triggering the publication of an event by calling the aggregates publish method and a calling which leads to, to some, some invariant checks and so on, I will um, I'll show this later, and calling the repository to save the published event to the database. Um, that brings us to the event domain model that is implemented as an aggregate composed of the event entity and value objects such as um, ID, name, status, description, and period. And the event entity is considered, as mentioned earlier, as the aggregate root that is designated as the ag aggregate public interface. And the aggregate um, implements domain logic. Uh, that's the one that that's, implements the domain logic and it's checking the, the business rule, the, the invariance. So for example, when we publish an, a conference event, it must not have been closed and, uh, and uh, already pu published before. So. And, uh, and the aggregate is supposed to be free of any technical concerns. It focuses um, purely on the domain logic. And when loading an aggregate from the database or saving the state changes, uh, state changes of an aggregate, um, the event um, application service is calling the event repository, an interface defining the persistence methods. And the event repository is implemented by the DynamoDB event repository, taking care of handling um, the database operations, and in this case, operations to a DynamoDB table. 
So we have the DynamoDB event repository adapter that implements the port specific interface and provides methods to load uh, data from a domain DynamoDB table and to update it uh, into a DynamoDB uh, table by using a DynamoDB specific client. So the combination of domain-driven design and hexagonal architecture enables you to build adaptive and evolvable services where you can exchange the outside and outer part of your system, uh, the infrastructure of your system, without affecting the business logic inside. And since domain-driven design focuses on areas where um, with complex business logic, domain-driven design is um, is not applicable ever, everywhere. Um, um, we need to focus on, on our course um, subdomain since that's the one that's supposed to be complex. That's the one that um, provides competitive advantage. And uh, so the core subdomain, that's the one we should implement as domain models. And the supporting and generic uh, subdomains, they could go uh, with architecture and business logic implementation patterns that are more suited for uh, simpler out subdomains or use or buy off the shelf um, um, products or outsource to utility supply suppliers. So in general, or um, uh, as a summary, domain driven design helps uh, with gaining domain knowledge. And before we develop a solution that solves the user needs, we need to understand the problem domain first. And the collaboration between the domain experts and development teams is an essential part of domain-driven design to obtain domain knowledge, which is described in terms of the shared language, the ubiquitous language. And the domain model is very crucial because, as mentioned earlier, the lack of such can have a huge impact on costs caused by poor software quality. So domain-driven design helps with aligning the software design to the business domain and um, comes with a core statement um, to build better software, its software design has to be aligned to the business domain, to the business needs, and to um, the business strategy. And domain-driven design also helps you to discover your core domain. And uh, um, the core domain is the one that provides competitive advantage and, ten and tends to be quite complex. The core domain, that's the one that we sh um, should strategically invest most in building house. And uh, so the core domain is the one where domain-driven design suits very well. And uh, also, uh, domain-driven design helps uh, with decomposing your system into modular components, the bounded context. And these bounded contexts support, uh, support you to know which serverless functions to group together in one Git repository, for example. And, um, but you do not apply domain-driven design everywhere. Um, domain-driven design suits very well for complex logic and fits best, best for your um, core subdomain. And at the end, I also would like to share also some resources that you can use to dive deeper into the topics that I have mentioned earlier during this talk. And at the end, thanks a lot for attending my talk, and I am looking forward to your questions. All right. Thank you, Susanna Kaiser, for that awesome talk. I love this topic of domain-driven design. Um, I think it's super interesting, um, but I also think it is a little bit confusing, and especially when we start talking about bounded context. And we had a question in the chat, um, which, by the way, um, if you are watching this, please go to uh, virtual.serverlessdays.io. There's a link for the Discord chat. Um, go down there and participate. You can ask questions, and if you ask the questions before I do this little interview after the, the calls or after the talks, um, then I can ask these questions for you. So one of the questions was about bounded context. So could you just explain a little bit more what a bounded context is? Of course. So um, a bounded context is something that forms um, a boundary around our domain model, right? So our domain model, which reflects um, the business rules and the business invariants, including the data of, of each uh, um, domain, is um, not living in its own. It's 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 uh, solely in in isolation. Instead, it's 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 um, surrounded by a bounded context, and a bounded context um, protects um, uh, the the integrity of of a domain model itself. It's also it comes with different types in terms of also that it's 
provides um, a linguistic and semantic boundary or in that, um, for example, that languages terms in one bounded context um, remains consistent, but it also provides an ownership boundary. So, for example, that a team can, uh, one bounded context is assigned to one team only, and but one team can also work on several bounded contexts. It also uh, provides a physical boundary in terms of like that you can um, uh, implement each bounded context separately with its own Git repository, with its own technical stack and so on. And it also um, allows you to apply um, per bounded context different architectural patterns and uh, apply different uh, business logic um, patterns as well. So in, in general, so to summarize is that um, uh, it's, it forms a um, consistency boundary around, uh, around the domain model itself. Right, and so that domain model, I think that's where it also gets confusing is where do you draw the line, right? So what, you know, so you have a lot of overlapping domain models in, in a business. I mean, it's not often that, you know, one department's going to call something, you know, a product number, maybe it's a product number in one, it's a SKU in another. But I mean, for the most part, there's a lot of overlapping language. So where do you draw the line? Like, how do you do that? This is something that happens or that is um, why you're collaborating with the domain experts, the development teams together with the domain experts. It's it's one of the challenging um, um, aspects of domain driven design where to draw, to, 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 to draw the line or the boundary between the domain models. And I tried to make this boundary um, um, to, to give an example during my talk about, for example, for the conference solution that we were talking about, that we, for example, have um, a session uh, domain model, a call for paper domain model, and uh, um, and so in, in, the, in the speaker domain model, for example, and for ex and these domain models were related by other bounded contexts as well. So, and for example, when you go in uh, scheduling a session for a conference, for example, it has different attributes like room or time slot and so on, and also different business rules such as does this uh, is a session that double scheduled or not. But these attributes and these rules are not relevant while um, submitting a session um, uh, for the uh, for the speaker itself, right? So there is more like a, um, title abstract and, and and talk description relevant to that mm -hmm. one. And when you see that there are some some um, semantic inconsistency, like that you that you're exploding, or that your um, that your dom domain model itself is getting bigger and bigger, and you try to mingle a lot of aspects to make to make it unique for for uh, the entire domains. So that is that is a strong indicator that you should draw a line in between, so that you have a clear uh, meaning, a clear consistency. Like for example, that you that you introduce. Um, uh, submitted sessions or um, as that you change your ubiquitous language in terms of that you're not talking about general about sessions, but for example, you talk about scheduled sessions, about um, um, submitted sessions and so on, so that you have this clear boundary uh, that it keeps your, your language uh, consistent, for example. Right, yeah, and that's certainly a challenging, it's challenging it to find that line, but, um, and, but if you find it, it's, it, it's good. Yeah, exactly. So, and it's always uh, the, so that uh, it's it's really challenging, and and sometimes is um, I guess the more you talk about and you collaborate with the domain experts, the more and more it becomes clear. Like um, because usually when we that's also one of the challenges, right? When we when we try to to build a software solution, that we dive deeply into the uh, tactical design or try to find an implement, implementation right away. But instead, we have to to figure out first, like, okay, what is our domain model? So we have to to understand the problem domain first before we can solve it. And that's something um, really challenging, but it helps when doing to collaborate with the domain experts. Yeah. And there are also so some we techniques. Have uh, as well, like event storming or something like that, that helps right. you to, to, to find the boundaries. Right. Yeah. So we had a couple of questions that are um, all kind of asking the same thing. And this has, it sort of has to do with, you know, how do bounded contexts help with serverless or help building serverless applications? But also this, this sort of, uh, I guess the question was more specific to the difference between a bounded context and a microservice and a Lambda function. And maybe just answering the question of how can bounded contexts help you build serverless applications would probably answer that. Yeah. So a bounded context helps you to, um, so first of all, like they are good uh, candidates for microservices. So they help you to, to organize uh, on the one side, to organize your, your source code on the one side, like do, it helps you to, to um, to, um, to 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 say to to expressly 
um, um, make it clear what what functions are belonging together to which which business function itself. It helps you to uh, what, for example, in, in terms of the serverless function, what serverless function should go together in what Git repository, and also um, what um, and to define a clear purpose of each function so that they are related to this bounded context, for example. So and also um, to make it clear. Uh, what kind of like, access right each each function serverless function has in terms of um, that you are not allowed to to um, uh, from from one AWS Lambda function for example to access the DynamoDB table of another bounded context which sits in another Git repository for example so to make it clear where your boundaries are in terms of like also organizing your code to to make it clear what the purpose what's the business purpose of your serverless function that you bundle together and also to make it clear where are uh, the access limits, like where they, where so each bounded context is then also uh, reflecting the access right um, for for each um, server um, functions that are sitting in one bounded context. Right. Yeah. And I also like to look at it as a bounded context. I think you're right. A microservice is a good candidate for a bounded context because it's containing a, a small bit of uh, of, of uh, functionality. But I always look at it as, as you know, a bounded context could have multiple microservices under it. Um, yeah. You know, and then every microservice could have multiple lambda functions. Um, but I think the key idea is that when you are encompassing them under the idea of a of a bounded context, that again, that's it's the domain model that's consistent. Um, and some of the you know the lower level implementations probably aren't as um, uh, aren't as important. So the last thing I want to ask you though is how ubiquitous is domain driven design? Is this something that a lot of people are doing? Because again, it it doesn't seem like a lot of people are doing this. More people should be doing this, but um, what are your thoughts on it, how uh, ubiquitous it is? Yes, yeah, so I guess it became more ubiquitous when we entered the field of microservices. Um, so when Eric Evans wrote his book, um, The Blue Bible of Domain Driven Design in 2003, um, I, I picked it up, I guess, um, I guess probably 12 years later. So when we introduced, I was, I pr was previously um, uh, working as a startup CTO when we transformed our models to microservices. And that's the first time that I um, got in touch with, uh, with domain-driven design. And um, at that po moment, it made more sense for me to introduce it because, okay, it, it's so crucial to to uh, to find the boundaries, to, write, to find the right seam where you decompose your models into microservices and now also how to, um, to organize your serverless functions. But I guess it's... Um, what I have noticed, it depends on how active the community is. So, for example, I have um, 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 realized different um, adaption level, like, for example, here in, in Germany or in Europe, it might be a little bit higher adaption than, for example, the in the US, but that mm -hmm. might be a personal impression that I have. But I guess it's right now since, um, I guess, since microservices have, have entered uh, the tech uh, tech field about software architecture and software design, um, then it's it's it was more ubiquitous than before. Awesome. All right. Well, Susanna, thank you again. This was an awesome talk, and thanks for thank for you. doing this little QA after the fact. Um, uh, if anybody has more questions for Susanna, jump into the Discord channel, virtual.serverlessdays.io, and you'll find her there. Um, we'll take a quick break, and we'll be back at uh, 10 minutes to the hour with Slobodan Stoyanovich's talk. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you.
Hey, everyone. Welcome back. Thanks again to Susanna Kaiser for that excellent talk on domain-driven design. Uh, from the beginning of this uh, conference, we were talking a little bit about full-stack serverless and something that has become incredibly popular uh, with, with uh, services or for single-page apps, things like that, has been GraphQL. So our next speaker is Slobodan Stojanovic. He is going to tell us about the power of serverless GraphQL using a server AWS called AppSync. So here is Slobodan. So every story needs a hero, but not all the heroes are the same. Some are superheroes from Marvel movies and comic books, and some are just the ordinary people. For example, the hero of our story today is just the ordinary developer. He works in a small team, mostly on the mid-size applications, most of the time he enjoys his job, unless he sends a push notification to thousands of uh, production customers. That happens to everyone, right? One day, uh, our hero's boss came with a new project. They need to build a new complex application. Our hero is happy to do that. He loves these kind of uh, challenges. However, they have a short deadline. How short? Well, as always, it should need to be ready for yesterday and it needs to be scalable and real-time. Our hero is a bit afraid of that. He built many different applications, but how should he build this? Because this is a really complex application that needs to be done fast. Well, don't worry about that. Uh, he, uh, his boss uh, kind of uh, found the solution. He hired a very famous consultant that will help him out with the app architecture which makes our hero really happy. And then the consultant came and he had a solution. Just use Kubernetes. It's well, well battle tested and uh, can be scaled, scaled well. Uh, many companies are using it, so it should work for us, right? Well, yeah, but our hero don't, uh, doesn't know how to use Kubernetes. And he doesn't have time to learn Kubernetes now because it needs to be done fast, right? And our hero is not sure how to do this. He's not even sure if he's the only one that doesn't know Kubernetes anymore or if he's good enough for this job or not. He built so many applications, but this one is a bit more challenging than anything before. Well, he spent hours and hours trying to learn things uh, in front of his computer with his fellow sidekick, uh, Robert Duck. Fortunately, his sidekick, as always, have some really good suggestions and uh, he, uh, sidekick, uh, his sidekick always helped him to, to solve the problems. This time, the sidekick said something that is a bit weird. Why shouldn't you try to use serverless GraphQL? Well, serverless GraphQL, what's that? Well. That's exactly a topic of our presentation today. We'll talk about serverless GraphQL, actually the power of serverless GraphQL with AppSync. But before we continue, let me introduce myself. I'm Slobodan Stojanovic. I'm CTO of Cloud Horizon and CTO of Vacation Tracker. Vacation Tracker is a leave tracking application uh, that uses uh, serverless GraphQL and AppSync uh, on the back end. I also uh, wrote a book about uh, serverless applications with Node.js with my friend Alexander Simovich. That book was published by Manning Publications. And I'm also AWS serverless hero. You can follow me on Twitter. Uh, I often uh, write about like serverless and some, some things that uh, we discover on our, uh, when, when we are building vacation tracker and some other projects using uh, serverless or while we are building some open source tools and things like this. But let's get back to our topic because that's definitely way more uh, important and interesting than I am. So serverless GraphQL, our hero knows what serverless, but what's this GraphQL thing? You might remember uh, almost 10 years ago, Mark Zuckerberg said that uh, their biggest mistake was betting too much on HTML5. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg is the owner of uh, Facebook. You might uh, know that social network. It's, it's quite famous. It's the place where your aunt is uh, posting your uh, 
old photos and uh, commenting on your new photos and do things like this, right? Uh, you have some posts, people can like them and comment on them. Uh, many other things can happen. But back in uh, 2012, uh, their mobile application was basically embedded uh, web view and uh, w with web application inside. Uh, and whenever that mobile application was loading new data, uh, it was sending requests to a server and server was returning HTML. So everything was rendered and then uh, the, the mobile app was just showing that. But there were problems with that. Uh, their application was freezing and crashing often, uh, often because uh, there, there was like a lot of data uh, receiving, uh, sending from uh, sent from uh, from their servers because they have a lot of data and Facebook and these were popular years for Facebook, of course. Uh, and the other problem was that uh, mobile applications were less like uh, less good because. Uh, these were still the early days of uh, mobile web and basically HTML5 and everything. So they had a lot of issues with that and then uh, they decided to do something else. They tried to build a native mobile application, which worked, but the problem was how do they load the data? They can send REST uh, API requests or maybe they can use Facebook uh, query language to get the data. But their big, big problem was that the data they requested for the application and the data that the server returned was uh, completely different. And that's not a problem if you have a small application, but if you are Facebook and if you're returning a lot of data, that makes your application really, really slow, on, especially on mobile devices. And Facebook is really important. Uh, uh, it's really important for Facebook that their mobile app is fast and that it works on uh, different devices and different networks. So in 2015, uh, they finally released something called GraphQL. And th the idea of GraphQL was that uh, you tell server what do you need from uh, the data and server provides exactly that. For example, if you want to request something about the user with ID 4802170 uh, and you don't want all the data about that user, you want the name, ID, few other things such as profile picture with uh, 50 pixels uh, size, and first five friend connections, you can do something like this. And then if you take a look at the right side, you'll see the response of that uh, GraphQL query. It will return exactly the same data, uh, just in JSON format filled with the real data. Nice, but why should we care about GraphQL? We don't have the same problems as Facebook, right? Well, we don't, most of the time we don't, but Let's see if we have some of these problems. When you're building your front-end clients, uh, do you have multiple platforms? For example, do you have mobile and web client? And if you do, there's a big chance that you have slightly different data requirements for these two clients because you, you're not able to show the, exactly the same data on the large screens on the desktop and in on the small screen, mobile screen in the mobile app. Or for example, on tablet and mobile and things like this. Or for example, uh, if if your backend serves data to client uh, from different sources, that, that can be really challenging because uh, you need to connect to, let's say multiple databases, but also to Stripe, to some other uh, payment processors, to some analytics and who knows what. Uh, do you have a complex state management and caching management on both front end and back end? If you're using like uh, React, Maybe you have uh, Redux or now uh, you can do context and things like these, but many people have complex uh, states uh, on front end now. It's not that simple anymore, but also on the back end, you need to have caching. You often have uh, really complex state management and things like these. And many of these things cause really slow pages, especially on mobile, uh, because Sometimes if you want to show the data on one screen, you need to send like 10 different HTTP requests. And there are some limits on, on the browsers and uh, it's especially important on mobile because on mobile networks, uh, mobile phones will optimize to send um, everything for, uh, to save, uh, like uh, to be able to uh, do that on the limited network. And uh, maybe your page will be even slower than it should be because uh, viewers network is not fast enough to get like 10 different uh, parallel requests and things like this. 
So if you have any of these symptoms, uh, you should care about GraphQL because it can be a cure for some of those symptoms. Why? Because GraphQL starts with uh, data shape. You define your data shape uh, as a schema and you explain GraphQL how do you want your data to be structured. And your data is always hierarchical, which is great because you can easily connect multiple sources because you always know the hierarchy of your data and it can connect well to relational uh, databases, but it can also be really effective for uh, no SQL databases or for like HTTP requests to third party services and things like this. GraphQL is also strongly typed, which means that uh, you always need to be sure that uh, your query uh, follows the strict, uh, strict types uh, of your GraphQL uh, data shape uh, and everything, which makes uh, your application like easier to maintain and uh, it's easier to catch the errors and everything. And the other important thing is that GraphQL is not a storage. So it's not a one database or uh, it's not graph uh, database. It's a protocol. It's something that talks to multiple different data sources, but it tells, uh, it defines the way that it communicates with everything and the way it returns the data and things like this, uh, which makes it really, really powerful. It's also introspective, which means that GraphQL itself can tell you which fields are available and what you can do which makes it even more powerful because you don't need like really complex uh, documentation and things like this. And finally, it's version free because you can change the data structure and everything, but in your query, you define exact data that you want. So it's not important if, uh, if your REST API is version one or version two or version three, as long as you can provide the same data back to your application. So without GraphQL, if you want to do uh, to pull the data from multiple sources, it works something like this. You send one request, get some data from, let's say, relational database. Then you send another request to get the data from uh, NoSQL database. And finally, you send another uh, uh, HTTP request to get some data from, let's say, analytics or something like that. And then you combine that data on your front end or maybe on your server. But with GraphQL, you basically define the data shape that, that you want. You send that data shape to GraphQL. It gets all the data from different data sources and returns the data shape, uh, the data shaped uh, exactly how you need it to you. So we mentioned uh, that it's strictly typed. So whenever you work with GraphQL, first you need to define some types. Let's say that we want to define author and post. You, we define some fields. We define like a connection between these fields. It's hierarchical, as we said. So for example, the author can contain some uh, posts. And then we define schema. Schema is basically that data shape that we have. Schema says that uh, we have like two different queries, uh, get author by ID and get post by title. Uh, which returns the array of posts and uh, then we need to do some uh, to make some resolvers resolvers basically tells graphql how to get the data from different sources in this case for example we want to get the author from uh, a row sql query from our sql database uh, but we want to get posts by uh, sending an HTTP request to our blog uh, or something like that and get uh, all the, the posts by one author or something like that. And finally, when we use this on our front end, we define our query, which says that we want to get the author with ID five and we want to have the name of that author. And uh, we want to have a list of posts. Each post will have a title, but as we can always like connect the data in different ways, as long as we uh, allow that with our schema, we can basically uh, list the name of the author of that post, which should be the same as the name of, uh, of the author above. When we do this, when we set, send a request, the server will parse that request to see if everything uh, works and if everything is written correctly. Then it will validate that request. It will see that uh, all types are uh, good. And finally, it will execute or run that request and get the data for us. And finally, uh, on the front end, we'll receive uh, the result similar to this. So we'll receive the JSON. As you can see, we have the name, we have the list of posts. Uh, each post have its own title and author name. That's it. It's that simple. But 
We sell queries. GraphQL also supports mutations. Uh, mutations are used when you want to uh, change some data on the server and also subscriptions, which can tell us, uh, tell us whenever some data is changed on the server. For example, when some, some mutation uh, is finished and things like this. Well, this GraphQL thing is really interesting, but we understand that now, but why do we need to make it serverless? Uh, our hero's uh, sidekick explains that well as everything else. You can use uh, GraphQL with anything you want. For example, you can use GraphQL with Kubernetes. However, that's not the best way. There are easier ways to uh, deploy your uh, and build your GraphQL applications. For example, if you build your application in a traditional way, non uh, without using serverless, you still need to take care of, about the infrastructure. You need to think about scaling this part of the application, but you also need to think about monitoring and all the other things that, uh, that you need to take care of uh, when you deploy your own infrastructure. Unless you make it serverless. When you make it serverless, uh, Operations part still exists, but it's like you outsource part of that work to AWS or any other provider like Azure or Google or whoever. They will just uh, they will scale this for you and they will do many uh, of the hard things for you. And then you need to uh, focus on what's important for you. And that's your business logic, your code and things like this. Well, that's nice. But how can I make my GraphQL app serverless? There are many ways to do that. Uh, I'll show you the AWS way, but uh, basically you can do this on uh, any serverless provider. So on AWS, you can do that manually by setting up API gateway and Lambda function. And then when you do that uh, on your Lambda function, you can basically generate your GraphQL and uh, query different uh, sources, generate uh, um, response and everything and return that to user. But you can also use AppSync. Okay, what's AppSync? AppSync is a managed service that uh, uses Graph GraphQL to make uh, to make it easy for applications to get exactly the data they need. Something that sounds like something we need. And our hero can use uh, GraphQL to make his application fa uh, faster. Okay, how? Let's see. First, our hero needs to define GraphQL schema. Then he can use uh, that schema to provision DynamoDB data sources and connect resolvers. Many of these things can do automatically uh, using AWS console or many other things. Then after that, our hero needs to write GraphQL queries and mutations and to connect all these things with his front end and he'll have the application uses serverless GraphQL. Sounds easy, right? Well, some things requires a lot of time and learning, of course, as anything else, but it's easy to start with. Let's try. So our hero started to thinking how to try this. Uh, he saw that he can start uh, with the guided schema wizard on AWS web console. Yeah, web console is that uh, weird web interface where you can do everything, but it's it's not that nice. Uh, but there are better alternatives such as AWS Amplify, uh, which is really good for front-end developers or CloudFormation or CDK, which is really, really good for when you have more complex backend application that you want to maintain and uh, add new functionalities and things like this. So our hero spent some time in front of his computer with his fellow sidekick and he tried to use Amplify to create a new application. He run Amplify add API, define GraphQL schema. And then when he finishes everything, he did Amplify push and boom, magic happened. That was fast. He had the, the application, the, the simple application done with uh, AWS Amplify. Then he spent like hours and hours working uh, and learning more. And then after like two weeks, he decided to show everything to the consultant. Well, as you can expect, the consultant said that that will never work. Amplify doesn't seem good enough for application as complex as ours. So is there anything else? Well, 
You can always start with Amplify, but then you can move to CloudFormation and CDK. It's not that easy to move to uh, CDK and CloudFormation, but uh, Amplify uses CloudFormation under the hood, so you can basically take that and continue developing it. Uh, there was an excellent Twitch series by my friend Aether Lessa, like a year ago or even more now. Uh, he built end-to-end -end application using Amplify and then he extended that application using CloudFormation and uh, he added some CDK support in the end. Uh, it shows you how, how to evolve complex application. Well, if you're starting from uh, scratch with uh, CDK, it looks it's probably the easiest way to start with uh, AppSync if you if you are a backend developer. Uh, for example, with TypeScript, it would look something like this: we would install a few Node modules, uh, we would import CDK and AppSync modules, then we'll define the new stack, we'll create a new uh, AppSync GraphQL API. Uh, give a name to that API and uh, path to, to our schema. And finally, we, we would export uh, or uh, send our GraphQL URL to, to the output. And we can uh, uh, deploy this application with CDK and we would have like uh, a simple GraphQL application ready. Okay, that sounds really, really interesting, but our application needs to be real time. How do you do that with uh, AppSync? Fortunately, AppSync lets you specify which part of uh, your data should be available in real time a manner using GraphQL subscriptions, which means that uh, you can, for example, say that uh, whenever uh, some mutation such as add post or update post or delete post is uh, uh, when, uh, whenever someone run that uh, mutation, it should send a real time subscription to, to your front end and you can connect easily and listen to these subscriptions which makes our uh, application real time almost out of the box. Okay, but it also needs to be scalable. Is this scalable enough? Well, it's serverless, right? But let's start with uh, real time subscriptions. Uh, there's an excellent post on uh, AWS blog uh, that shows uh, they tested uh, AppSync real time uh, subscriptions uh, almost a year ago and uh, they made like more than 10 million parallel uh, subscriptions and everything worked without any issues. And other parts of, uh, of app sync application and your GraphQL applications are DynamoDB, Lambda and many other services and most of these services are uh, well scalable and uh, your application will most of the time be scalable out of the box. Okay, nice. But you mentioned DynamoDB. What if I need to add a search functionality? We have a search functionality in our application. What should we do in that case? Fortunately, AWS AppSync supports Amazon Elasticsearch. So you can out of the box connect to Amazon Elasticsearch and do simple lookups, complex queries and mappings, full text search, fuzzy search, and even geo lookups and things like this. So you can do that, but you can also connect to some other sources. Well, how? How do you connect to an existing application or some third party uh, source? Maybe maybe we want to use uh, Algolia or something like that for our search. Well, that's fine. We can use our uh, app sync and connect that to our Lambda function and do any kind of logic and just return the result. Okay, nice. But what about roles and permissions? I bet that's really hard here. Well, out of the box uh, in AppSync, you can protect your GraphQL or part of your GraphQL with uh, API key, uh, also with AWS IAM authorization, with OpenID Connect authorization, and finally with Amazon Cognito user pools. Um, and you can use different like uh, protections for different parts of the application. Okay, but how do we make this application multi-tenant? We need that. Well. You can use Cognito groups and allow uh, different group to run different queries and see different things. Or if you really need fine-grained permissions, uh, you can use you can use resolver mapping templates. What? Well, wait. What are resolver mapping templates? Well, you can use something called Apache Velocity Template Language or VTL to connect your application and uh, do fine-grained permissions and everything. What's VTL? 
I would say that WTL is an alien language. It's Java based, right? Uh, it's really hard to test in isolation uh, in a serverless application, especially in AWS cloud formation. It's not impossible, of course, but it's not that easy. So in uh, in VTL, we would do something like this. So for example, if the context result uh, field owner is equal to context identity username will return the result or otherwise will return unauthorized uh, error. Uh, this is probably not the best example, but you can do many things with VTL. Okay, but how do you test this? This seems really, really complex, right? It is, but uh, there are things you can use to test this. For example, uh, we use uh, AWS Amplify App Sync Simulator library from NPM, which is part of uh, Amplify uh, CLI, which makes your application, which allows you to run your application locally and simulate everything. And we use uh, that simulator part. Uh, we created a few helpers. And then what we do is uh, we read our VTL template from the disk. Uh, pack it in a in a way that we need to for example it needs to uh to have an object with its content equals vtl uh, content we create an instance of this simulator and finally we create a new velocity template with that template and simulator and then in our tests this is just uh and typescript but you can do this in uh basically uh, any JavaScript uh, and Node.js uh, library uh, that you use for testing. You can probably do something similar in Python and you can also use uh, Java to test uh, VTL templates, which is probably the easiest way, but uh, VTL templates from AWS have some uh, functions, uh, helper functions that needs, uh, that you would need to simulate or mock or whatever. Here, everything is done for us. So in our test, we want to create some kind of context. And then we want to render our uh, template with these context values. Uh, and we want to check if uh, if the, the response is exactly what we expect it to be. Ha, huh. okay. I don't like this approach. Well, our hero don't like it either. There are some people that really love this approach, but we'll not talk about them today. Well, fortunately, there's an alternative. Uh, if you don't want to use this, uh, you can, AppSync will allow you to, to use direct Lambda resolvers and basically skip VTL completely and just pass everything to your Lambda function and do everything in your Lambda function. It adds uh, some uh, latency and some things like these, but uh, most of the time that's not a big problem. Okay, but what if I want to reuse some logic? If you use Lambda function, that's easy, right? But if you don't use Lambda function, uh, the other option is to use pipeline resolvers. It's basically a pipeline of uh, different resolvers. You can put the same resolver in many different templates, but then you can have a second resolver that is uh, really special for exactly that template or something like that. And you can dis define these pipeline resolvers in VTL and uh, you can even combine the direct Lambda resolvers with that. You can test them the same way that I showed you, uh, you test VTL templates. Okay, but this is still too complex for front end, right? Well, not really because AWS Amplify is basically a library that helps front end developers to work with uh, AppSync. It generates the backend logic for you and everything else. It helps you to automate things, but it also gives you a nice libraries for the front end. For example, uh, if you're using React, you will have like a really nice temp, uh, components and also uh, libraries that will allow you to sign up, to sign in, to uh, make GraphQL requests and do many other things. You can do the same for uh, Vue.js and for Angular, and there are libraries for uh, Vanilla JS, but also uh, there are some new libraries for Android and iOS for native applications. And that's not all. Uh, if you're using uh, TypeScript or JavaScript, uh, AWS Amplify can even generate some queries, mutations, and subscriptions for you. So it's it's even more powerful than uh, you would expect. Okay, I give up. This is really cool. Well, that's not all. 
AppSync supports caching and offline data synchronization, which means that you can cache part of uh, everything in your GraphQL and you can also out of the box like uh, uh, do caching and everything, but you can also like do uh, save uh, store some data locally and then uh, sync everything with the uh, remote, uh, for example, if you want your application to work offline and things like this. Okay, okay, nice. You show some tests, but how do you test everything? Well, testing really depends on your approach, but uh, it's good to have end-to-end -end tests in these cases because you want to test your application uh, completely to, to, to be sure that uh, everything from end-to-end -end works and then you need to run end-to-end -end tests for that. But you don't want to run end-to-end -end tests while you're developing your applications. Uh, so you can, you can test your Lambda code uh, in isolation or as you saw, you can do unit tests for BTL templates in isolation. But that's probably uh, worth another talk and uh, I'll definitely write some articles on uh, these topics. And also, uh, while you're building everything, if you're using AWS Amplify, Amplify will allow you to uh, simulate everything locally and run your application locally. Nice. But what if I need to build some more complex architecture? For example, we need CQRS in this application that we are working on. Well, that's possible too. So GraphQL defines mutations, subscriptions, and queries, as we said. Uh, and most of the time they are connected. They, they read the same uh, source or sources uh, and query from the same sources. But for Vacation Tracker, our leave tracking app, we had a slightly different problem. We wanted to, to know the history of everything because someone can have can add a leave in the past or change of working days or add holidays and things can change over time. So we want to have the stream of events and we use GraphQL like this. We send some mutation that stores the events to uh, DynamoDB and then send some uh, notification to EventBridge. EventBridge will trigger different Lambda function and process that logic. And then when the logic is completely processed, uh, it will send the subscription uh, event, real-time subscription event uh, back to, to our front end. So user can know that something really finished on the back. And uh, it also generates some data for read-only tables. Uh, why? Because uh, we uh, it's complex to read the state always from uh, these events. We want to have some cached state. Whenever we do query from the uh, dashboard, it will just read from these read tables and uh, give you the data basically immediately. There's some slight delay, of course, but that's uh, that's okay. It's like uh, any other CQRS application. Well. Our consultant gave up and it be, uh, he became serverless GraphQL guru now because you can do everything with serverless GraphQL. But more important, uh, our hero, the hero of our story became basically a superhero. He, he made a complex application, he learned a new technology and he knows that he's not too, uh, that he's good enough for the job he's doing. Uh, it's not always important to use the, the latest technology that everyone is using, the most popular technology. Just find something that solves the problem for you and your business. And uh, for us, uh, serverless GraphQL works really, really uh, nicely. Let's do a quick summary uh, to wrap up. Uh, so basically, GraphQL makes your front-end and back-end connection effortless. Uh, AppSync makes your GraphQL management effortless. And finally, serverless GraphQL makes you a superhero. You still need to learn a lot of things. It takes time and uh, you still need to, a lot of things will be pushed to your front end and uh, your front end application will get even more complex, but that's fine. Uh, you'll learn how to do that. And I'm sure there will be some other uh, services and applications that will make that management easier and, uh, than ever before. That's it. You can follow me on Twitter. Uh, we're preparing some nice, uh, GraphQL, uh, a short course is basically uh, to help you to learn like uh, basic things and testing and things like this. So follow me if you want to uh, some updates uh, on that. And uh, if you want to check how does this work in production and to see what I'm working on day to day, uh, take a look at vacationtracker.io. That's a product that I'm building. So thank you. Uh, and I really hope we'll see each other in, in person soon. Hey everyone, we're here with Slobodan Stojanovic. Slobodan, thank you for the excellent talk. Thanks.
thanks for having me. Um, so a lot of comments. People love the style of your slides. So um, very entertaining. Um, good stuff there. Uh, by the way, if people are not in the Discord channel, you need to jump over there now, um, virtual.servlessdays.io. A um, lot of great um, Simpson references going on in there. It's just a good chat that's uh, really adding to these these talks. So make sure you jump over into that. Um, all right, so Slobodan, uh, AppSync, awesome service. Um, somebody asked the question, though, whether or not um, Amplify was uh, it, whether or not Amplify was good enough for production. Amplify being the the framework piece of it. But uh, what what are your thoughts on that? Because you seem to mention that in the talk, and people wanted some clarification. So yeah, uh, I probably made the confusion there with the uh, with my explanation. So uh, I I really love Amplify. Uh, most of the time, I use uh, front end uh, libraries for Amplify. We use them at Vacation Tracker. We uh, basically uh, do everything uh, from the front end using Amplify. We connect to uh, AppSync. We also uh, connect to uh, API Gateway uh, for something uh, using Amplify. And we also use Amplify to log in and sign up and uh, do custom out, uh, cognito out, and things like this. But uh, what I uh, tried to say, uh, tried to say, uh, say was that uh, basically. Uh, Amplify is great if you're building uh, some kind of not smaller project. Uh, in, uh, in, uh, I don't mean smaller in a scale or anything like that. But if you need to customize your uh, application a lot on the backend side, uh, for me it's a bit harder to to uh, extend Amplify and uh, with some additional like uh, functionalities and things like these. It's much easier when you have like CloudFormation or CDK. Then you can. Uh, simply write uh, additional services. If you're more familiar uh, with backend, it's probably better to use uh, CloudFormation or uh, CDK. Uh, if you're a front-end, Amplify will be perfect for uh, for your project. Right, so, yeah, and Amplify gets you very far. I mean, you can go, you can, oh, you yeah, can do quite sure. a bit with Amplify, right, yeah. And so, you can is do that everything, something you should, basically. That's, right, um, yeah. and so is that something you would suggest where if you were building a front-end application, um, maybe you want to write some of the back-end stuff yourself, would you still you know, uh, recommend using the Amplify framework on the front, uh, or is that yeah, something you would want to go custom? Definitely. Uh, I would always uh, recommend uh, Amplify framework on the front-end, and uh, if you're not that familiar with uh, CloudFormation and, uh, or CDK, then you should definitely try uh, working with Amplify also on the back end, at least until you have like a better idea of what you want to build on the back end and how do you want to control that data and how do it really depends on what are you building. Right, right. So, okay, so let's talk about GraphQL a little bit um, and specifically Amplify. So, I'm uh, sorry, no, uh, AppSync. So when you're when you're creating these um, verse, you need to write VTL templates, and the um, the the console in AWS allows you to sort of write those as part of it. It, it gives you a little sort of playground to do that, which is helpful. But um, but how do you test those? That's a question that uh, has come up quite a bit. How do you test those VTL templates? So you don't need to to use VTL templates. You can use direct from the result and then uh, have your Lambda function and uh, basically test your code. But uh, it's like much more power, uh, not powerful, but uh, you remove one uh, one dependency from everything. You remove Lambda if you just use VTL templates and uh, write, uh, connect directly your uh, app sync to your, for example, DynamoDB. Uh, and we, we spent a lot of time thinking how to test that because uh, you can do end-to-end -end tests for sure and that's fine, but end-to-end -end tests are not that useful for like uh, development, it's uh, when you run them, it takes some time to um, to of course uh, uh, execute them and to see if anything fails and things like these. Uh, you can use Amplify there to to like uh, simulate to basically uh, run your GraphQL backend uh, locally and test if everything works. But then I thought like maybe we can use the same libraries to to write some automated tests. So what we did in the end, we tried to find what's uh, Amplify CLI is using in, the, uh, in their code to to run that uh, simulated version of uh, of uh, sorry uh, of uh, AppSync uh, backend on your machine, and we mm -hmm. reuse the same libraries to, uh, uh, to literally run these tests inside Jest. So uh, you can you can run unit tests uh, for your VTL templates from Jest, and I'm working on a blog post for that, and I really hope that will be done 
in next like a uh, week or so. So uh, I'll explain uh, what do we do, but basically what we are doing, we are just uh, searching for, for parts of uh, Amplify CLI that we can use and importing them into our tests. And then uh, you can easily test uh, the logic of your uh, your VTL templates and everything you have, uh, even pipeline resolvers. Uh, and uh, yeah, you can have unit tests for these. It's awesome. much easier so, than to develop them. Yeah. Right, right. So you mentioned Lambda resolvers, right, which is a new, relatively new feature, I think, that came out for uh, being able to, to have that um, send back the data and 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 you could and so I'm just wondering if this is something you would suggest that if you're not comfortable with VTL um, and you just kind of want to get going with with GraphQL and with AppSync is that something you would suggest is to use those lambda resolvers to build um, build those data models originally and then maybe once you feel comfortable with that you could start transitioning them over to sort of the direct connections via VTL yeah, you can definitely try to do that, and that will work uh, perfectly fine. But uh, if you're planning to invest more time uh, and build something using AppSync for your product, maybe it makes sense to to spend some time and learn how uh, VTL templates work. Uh, I mentioned that they're like uh, alien language, and they look like that uh, at the beginning, but uh, it's basically just a templating language. So but after some time, you, you, you're more familiar with them. Uh, so it's not that hard to, to write them after some time. If you, if you have a way to test them, then it's, it's easy because it's like you can write tests and then you can play with like different things inside the VTL template. But yeah, you definitely uh, can do, uh, if, if you know how to do lambdas and everything, uh, you can do that for, for the beginning. That will work perfectly fine. And uh, even the latency will not be uh, much bigger because it's like a, that's a small lambda function that does just one thing. So, yeah. Right. Right. All right. So one more question in here. Um, any thoughts or advice about how to best architect and amplify slash app sync app together with Sam for the back end? Yeah. So uh, basically what, what we do, we have uh, we have uh, SAM and we have CloudFormation template. Uh, we we uh, we use uh, GraphQL and everything else inside. Um, sorry, inside these templates, and we use Amplify only on the front end side. Uh, I'll definitely show our uh, architecture and uh, more details in that blog post that uh, I'm uh, working on. But basically. Uh, it's a pretty simple setup uh, for the GraphQL itself. It's just the, the most complex part is that uh, VTL templates and uh, uh, all the DynamoDB tables that we are creating uh, by ourselves because uh, we have uh, some things are single table design and you don't need to do that. But uh, we want to do that for our events because we want to be able to, to do one query and get all the events that we need at that moment. But uh, yeah, you don't need to do that, uh, obviously, for an, uh, if you don't like that approach. But basically, uh, yeah, there are a lot of uh, learned on our way, and uh, you can you can just start with CDK or with uh, with Sam and uh, CloudFormation by like uh, creating a new GraphQL and starting with a few simple resolvers, and then after that, uh, yeah, uh, it's you need to to be sure uh, that uh, that you can just. Uh, take these VTL templates outside of your CloudFormation because you want to be able to test them. If they're inside the CloudFormation file, then yeah, uh, it will be really, really hard to test them. Yes. So yeah. Harder. Awesome. All right, well, Slobodan, thank you so much for talking today. Excellent talk. Um, so really appreciate thank it. You. All right, so uh, everyone, we are going to take a uh, break for about 12 minutes or so. We will be back um, at 45 minutes past the hour. Uh, I just want to mention again, you know, thanks to our sponsors today, Thundra, Stackery, Senzo, and their homeschool offering, um, and Epsigon. So uh, we'll take about a 11-minute break or so. Uh, we will see you back at 45 minutes past the hour. Thanks.
Hey everyone, welcome back. I hope you had a good quick break there and we have a few more talks left for you um, today. So I hope you will stick around, join that Discord channel, uh, virtual.servicedays.io, ask questions of the speakers uh, and, uh, and, and interact with members of the serverless community. It's not quite like being in, you know, in person and meeting up with people, but hopefully we'll get back to that at some point soon. But it is, it's pretty good. A lot of great ideas in there, so make sure you join. Uh, our next speaker is Alexandra Abba. She is a um, going to be, she's going to be doing a presentation where she ran an experiment um, trying to create a fully serverless workflow management platform um, on Google Cloud. So here is Alexandra's talk. Uh, take it away. Hey there, I'm Alexandra, and I'm going to talk about serverless workflows, specifically on Google Cloud. All right, so I'm a GCP certified data engineer, and I'm also a technical instructor at DataStack TV. So I put here my Twitter and GitHub handle. Feel free to shoot me questions after the presentation. Okay, so I'm going to talk about first um, context. So I'm going to give you a bit of a context because I'm a data engineer and I'm going to talk about workflows specifically in data engineering. So I'm going to make it clear what those are. Uh, after that, we are going to build an imaginary Apache Airflow. <laughs> so a serverless version of Apache Airflow on Google Cloud. And then we are going to compare uh, Apache Airflow with this new serverless workflow manager that we've just built. So first, let's make it clear what workflow management is. What is a workflow? So in data engineering, a workflow is a data pipeline. A more specific group uh, is um, ETL pipelines or extract transform load pipelines. So you extract, you extract some data from somewhere, you apply some transformations, and then you load the data into a sink somewhere else. Or you can think of um, machine learning pipelines as well. So you prepare some data for a machine learning model and then you feed that data into a machine learning model uh, in order to train that model. And then let's say you uh, deploy the data into production or you serve that model as an API, something like that. So these are workflows and these can be managed and there are services specifically for managing these workflows. So what does it mean to manage these workflows? So a workflow management system should be able to um, allow you to write workflows in a configuration language. You should be able to organize your workflows and then you should be able to execute your workflows and schedule your workflows. So a system like this um, should be able to, so let's say you said that you would like to schedule your workflow. So it should run um, every day at midnight then this workflow scheduler system should be able to trigger your workflow every day at midnight. And you also would like to monitor your workflows. So you would like to see the status of task executions and the status of your workflows themselves. So let's look at how the workflow landscape looks like. Um, so this whole workflow scheduling, workflow management thing started with um, just plain cron jobs. And then Hadoop came along and developers had the need to schedule Hadoop jobs. So in the Hadoop ecosystem, we have Apache OZ and Azkaban for managing Hadoop jobs. Later on, um, the cloud came along and more systems. And then you had the need or developers had the need for general purpose workflow schedulers or workflow managers. So these are Apache Airflow and Luigi. Luigi um, is developed by Spotify and Apache Airflow was originally developed by Airbnb. And then later on, um, we got serverless workflows. One uh, is one option is AWS Step Function. And the new thing now is cloud workflows. So that is something that I'm going to talk about in detail in this presentation. So cloud workflows was released in, in a month or in two months. So it's quite new and it enables some new things on Google Cloud. Okay, so this chart shows the popularity of 
workflow schedulers or of different workflow schedulers. So on the y-axis, you have the GitHub stars and on the other one, the time. So the uh, red one is Apache Airflow and the blue one is Luigi. So as you can see that Apache Airflow overtook uh, Luigi. So Apache Airflow is now the most popular and the most widely used workflow scheduler. So let's talk a bit more about Airflow then. Airflow is an open source uh, library. It's a top level Apache project. It requires you to write your pipelines uh, in Python. And so as, so as I said, these are pipelines and in pipelines you have tasks and all these tasks are defined by operators. So the operators are the main building blocks of an Apache Airflow pipeline and for example, Google Cloud or AWS, they all contribute a huge set of operators in order for developers to seamlessly use their clouds um, through Apache Airflow. Um, so, so Apache Airflow has a, a rich ecosystem uh, around it and many people are contributing different uh, operators to Apache Airflow. It also has managed services. So there is one managed service on Google Cloud called uh, Cloud Composer, and there's a third-party managed service called Astronomer IO. So Apache Airflow, as I mentioned earlier, is usually used for ETL processing and machine learning pipelines. Um, just to give you some exact use cases or exact examples, um, I personally worked with Lush uh, on a machine learning pipeline where we built um, and scheduled this pipeline using Apache Airflow. The first part of the pipeline was about preparing data and the second part of the pipeline made sure that we trained the machine learning model with the prepared data. Um, the pipeline was also able to um, pick up new data and retrain the machine, machine learning model. Another example I worked on was a batch pipeline where we had to schedule a, a, th a ton of SQL queries and these queries were interconnected. So the dependencies between them were quite important. We needed to run all these queries in BigQuery. So we created um, a Python configuration file and we had to schedule identical workflows for different departments. So we ended up writing a single Python configuration file and dynamically generated workflows for different departments. All right, so we would like to build a serverless Airflow basically. Why the hell we would do that? So what's the promise here? So I guess the first one is no infrastructure management. We don't need to um, manage an Airflow infrastructure. Airflow has many components. It has workers, it has an executor, scheduler. So if you have a large Airflow cluster with many workers, I guess this promise that you don't need to manage infrastructure um, could lower uh, really the cost of maintaining a workflow manager. The other one is that um, you are, or the developer is basically forced to write um, its steps, so the workflow steps in the form of mini APIs, which is quite beneficial, I think, because you need to write them in a way that they are um, stateless and they are reusable. And the last promise is lower price. Okay, so if you would like to build a serverless version of Airflow, let's have a look at how Airflow looks like in the background. So this is the architecture of Airflow. Airflow has a metadata data database, which is this yellow square here. All the components of Airflow interact with this metadata database. They read and write from this database. So we have the web UI here. The web UI reads the status of tasks, reads the status of DAGs from this metadata database, and then it displays all these details in the web UI. We also have a scheduler. A scheduler is responsible for scheduling the workflows. So it has to trigger a workflow, let's say every hour, if you set it um, to be triggered every hour. The executor is responsible for actually executing the workflows, so getting the work done. It is also responsible for managing the workers. So it basically tells a worker to execute a task um, when it needs to. So 
Based on these components, we can build something like this on Google Cloud. So this is basically, we are just trying to copy the components of Airflow with, with serverless um, products or serverless services. So for the scheduler, we can use Cloud Scheduler from Google Cloud, which is a serverless cron job manager. Um, so we, we can use Cloud Scheduler to trigger cloud workflows so in workflows, we can write our workflows and workflows will execute these pipelines. So this can be our executor. And the steps in these workflows can be cloud functions. So actually the, the user code will go into cloud functions and then workflows will trigger uh, cloud functions. So cloud functions are going to be our workers. And then the web UI is going to be just Google Cloud Console. In Google Cloud Console, we can access uh, all these components um, on a nice uh, visual UI, and we can also access the logs and monitor these components. Okay, so in the next part of, of my presentation, I would like to compare Apache Airflow with this um, cloud workflows architecture that we just built. So in order to do so, I came up with a use case. So in this use case, we have, um, let's imagine that we work for a logistics company and as a data engineer, and we have cars on the roads and all these cars have sensors in them. And these sensors are connected. They are connected to a cellular network and they are able to send data to cloud storage. So let's say that they send data every hour uh, and the data is in CSV format. And our data scientists and data scientists and analysts asked us to load all that data into Google BigQuery, which is our data warehouse, so they can further analyze the historical sensor data. So this is quite a typical use case for a data engineer. We just um, take the data from storage and then load it into a data warehouse. Well, this is the pipeline I came up with. Um, it is a bit more difficult than it should be, but I wanted to try it a few things with cloud workflows. So the first step is that we list the new files in, in a storage bucket. We check if there are any new files. If there are no new files, then we end the pipeline. If we find new files, then we move the files into a processing folder. After that, we check if the BigQuery dataset exists that we are looking for. If it doesn't exist, then we create a new dataset. If it exists, then um, we just load the data uh, into the dataset, in into a table in that dataset. And then uh, when we are done loading all the files, then we are going to move these files into a backup folder. So as I said, I actually um, developed this. So you can find the whole source code on my GitHub under the serverless workflows repo. Okay, so now I'm going to show you how this works. So first I show you how the pipeline looks like. So as you can see, this is a YAML pipeline. Um, here I define that this is main pipeline and I expect some parameters. So Workflows is also, it also works as an API. So you can call uh, a pipeline or a workflow as an API endpoint, and you can send it a, a JSON uh, body, a JSON string, and that's going to be, uh, those are going to be the input arguments. So I expect a JSON string here, which has a project, a region, and the bucket. And then you can see the next uh, step is listing the files in the bucket. So this is a post call, um, post API call to a cloud function called list files. And then we also send a JSON body, uh, which includes a bucket and a prefix because you want to list the files in the landing folder. And then this request will come back uh, a list of files, uh, which it has found in the landing folder. And we can assign the list of files to a variable called file names. And then later on, we can share this variable with other steps in our workflow. Okay, so 
Now let's deploy this pipeline in a Google Cloud project and then let's execute it. So I have the commands prepared that we need to run. First of all, we deploy the pipeline called BigQuery data load from this BigQuery data load YAML file. Just go to the workflows UI. So as you can see, I don't have any workflows yet. All the cloud functions that um, this workflow will call are already deployed in this project. Okay, so we deploy this pipeline. So let's refresh. And also, um, as I said, we expect some data to be in cloud storage. I already uploaded some CSV files into a cloud storage bucket. So as you can see, we have here our new workflow called BigQuery Data Load. So now we can start this uh, workflow. I'm going to trigger it from the command line. We could actually trigger it from, from the UI as well. So we say that let's execute the BigQuery data load on this location. And this is our input JSON string. So it has a bucket and a project and the region. All right, so it kicked off the pipeline. So now if I click on uh, the name of this workflow, you can see here that we have one active run. And here we would like to see an output. Actually, it should come back uh, with an OK. All right, so we got the OK. Uh, so we expect it to load some data into BigQuery. We didn't have any data sets before. So we expect it to, have, to create a new data set and then create a table there called history. Okay. All right. So we have a car analytics data set and we have a table called history, which is great. All right. So our workflow just ran. Let's go back to the presentation. Okay. All right. So now I would like to go through a few aspects of writing code for Airflow and writing code for cloud workflows. Um, so the first thing uh, is that you need to write a workflow in YAML for cloud workflows, while for Airflow, you need to write it in Python. So these are just some example snippets. Um, well, I guess if you know Python already, then writing Apache Airflow, writing, writing um, the workflows for Apache Airflow is quite straightforward. Writing YAML um, is not too difficult, but there are a few syntax tricks um, that I needed to just look up. So they have actually a syntax reference, um, which is quite good, that you definitely need to go through in order to write these pipelines in YAML. The next, next aspect is um, defining tasks. So I mentioned earlier that for Apache Airflow, uh, your tasks are defined by operators. And there are many operators which are already defined. So you, just, uh, you, you can just use them. For example, there is a BigQuery operator that can run queries for you. So you don't need to call the um, you know, the BigQuery client library and then use that to run the queries. You, you can just use the BigQuery operator, which does all that for you in the background. But um, in cloud workflows, you cannot do that. So the first difference is that you don't write operators, you write cloud functions. And in cloud functions, it's a bit different because these are so you, you, need, you basically write mini APIs. You expect a request and then um, you send back some response. And you don't have like predefined um, cloud functions that you can use. So you actually need to use the client library. Like here in this function, I um, list the files in a, a cloud storage bucket. And then I need to use the client library, initialize the client, and then use the methods from the client library. I mean, it's not that bad, but there are some things that um, 
I guess, th th that are already given in Apache Airflow, and then you need to start from scratch um, with cloud functions. The other aspect is the user interface um, and logging and debugging. So Apache Airflow has this really nice UI, which uh, generates a lot of um, views for you. So it shows how much time does it take to run different tasks, so you can find some bottlenecks. It also shows um, the code, and it also shows this nice deck view. I think it will come up now. No. Anyway, so... Uh, in Google Cloud Console, you don't have any visual. Okay, so this is the deck view that I mentioned. This is a really nice way to see the dependencies between your tasks. You don't actually have that for cloud workflows. Um, you can although, I mean, you have a nice UI, so you can trigger the decks from the UI. You can see the logs and um, the executions, but you, you, you don't have uh, so many you know, uh, visual things uh, in the UI of uh, cloud workflows. Yeah, and also about logging and debugging. So with cloud workflows, it's quite tricky because it's not only workflows that you need to debug, it's cloud functions and it's also cloud scheduler. So if you don't have a clue where it went wrong, then you have to go through all these um, services and check the logs for all of them, which can be quite tedious. Um, so I guess um, the logging and debugging experience um, for Airflow is much better because you have a centralized place where you can access all the logs. All right, variables. So being able to parameterize a workflow is really important because you want to have a workflow, you want to be able to deploy it in dev, in pre-prod and prod, and you just want to, um, you know, change these variables dynamically. So in Airflow, you can save these variables in your environment, and then you can just uh, call them in your pipeline. While in um, cloud workflows, you cannot really save them in, in the environment. There is no metadata database. We abstract away from this concept. So your workflow is a, a stateless um, API. So all variables that you would like to access in your workflow needs to be sent to the workflow when the workflow is called in the JSON body in the request. The next one is branching. So in Airflow, we have this so-called branch Python operator um, that we can use to branch our workflow. While in cloud workflows, we have switch. So here I'm using the branch Python operator to decide if it's a weekday or a weekend. And I can just do that using um, a traditional Python function. And then I will just uh, return the name of the task that I would like to follow as the next task. Um, in Cloud Workflows, in YAML, I can do the same thing like this. So I can use a Cloud function to get me the current time or something like that. And then I can use a conditional switch. And here I need to define a condition. For example, here I check if the day that I got back is Saturday or Sunday, and then I um, return the, so then I specify that the next task should be the weekend task. Otherwise it should be the weekday task. So that's not something that is uh, immediately obvious when you would like to, um, write a workflow in YAML. So as I said, like, I think it's, it's uh, definitely really beneficial to go through the syntax um, reference. All right, the last aspect is the cost comparison. So uh, in Airflow, you have two options. First, um, a self-hosted single machine or a cluster, or the other option is using a managed service. So. I guess uh, if we compare using a managed service and using a self-hosted solution, then the self-hosted self is definitely cheaper when, when you have the um, capability and knowledge uh, for maintaining a, a cluster of, um, of Airflow. Um, and I would say that if you have a large number of workflows, then using Apache Airflow is definitely 
uh, your choice definitely more uh, definitely better um, cloud workflows so actually the first 5000 um, api calls are free so if you have small workflows um, and only a few of them, then using cloud workflows can be really beneficial. So I guess using a few, having a few workflows, um, when you have a few workflows, then it's cheaper to use cloud workflows. But when you have a large number of workflows, it's cheaper to use Apache Airflow. All right, um, so basically that's it. I collected a few links. Um, that could be useful for you if you would like to research more cloud workflows or if you would like to uh, know more about Apache Airflow. And uh, in the end, a little promo. So as I said, I'm a, an instructor at Datastack TV. So we have many really nice courses there. Uh, I actually have a comprehensive Apache Airflow course that you can take if you wanna know more about Apache Airflow. So you can use this um, coupon code uh, several as days uh, so you will get the first month for free if you subscribe for the monthly membership all right thanks very much for listening if you have any questions feel free to shoot me questions on twitter bye Hey everyone, welcome back. I am joined live by Alexandra Abash, that I'm doing my best to pronounce her last name. Um, and excellent talk, Alexandra. Thank you so much for, for being here. Thank you. Um, all right, so we have a couple of questions. Uh, one of the questions has to do with supported runtimes and languages. So uh, if cloud function supports, so can you use any of the cloud function supported languages within a cloud workflow? Yeah, exactly. So you you don't need to define the cloud functions in Python, um, how I did in, in the demo. You can use any of the supporting languages for cloud functions. Awesome. All right. And then in Airflow, I know you can configure dependencies between different workflows. Is that something that you can do with serverless workflows as well? Yeah, so it's not as sophisticated as Airflow because in Airflow you can set um, you can set the specific dependencies between uh, workflows or between a specific tasks uh, and the workflow. But in cloud functions, you can use a trick like because, um, sorry, in workflows, you can use a trick because you, workflows uh, cause APIs. And a workflow itself is an API endpoint or you can call it through an API endpoint. So you can call a workflow from a workflow. So in this way, you can set a dependency between workflows. Um, but you cannot define them uh, via the UI or anything like that. Okay. And then what, so if you just are calling APIs, can you call like AWS services through a uh, workflow? Yeah, so basically you can call any API endpoint. It could be AWS, it could be Azure, it could be anything else, any other API endpoint, as long as you have the permissions to call that endpoint. All right now, and I think um, I think you said this at the end of your presentation, but just to clarify, so if you ran a similar workload on Airflow versus GCP workflows, like wh which one would be cheaper? So that depends on two things: how many workflows you manage and how many API calls you do in a workflow. So because workflows is priced per API call. So if you do a lot of API calls, it might be cheaper to just go with Airflow. Or if you have a lot of workflows, then it, it is probably cheaper uh, to manage um, your workflows via Airflow, not uh, Google workflows. So I would say if you have a few, a few workflows, a few simpler, simpler workflows, then going with Google workflows is definitely cheaper. But if you have more complex workflows and many workflows to manage, then Airflow is probably cheaper. Awesome. All right. Um, well, listen, Alexander, thank you so much for the talk and thank you for being here. Um, for everyone else listening, uh, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be back at, let's see, 20 past the hour um, with Maria Hager's talk. Um, so we will see you then. Uh, Alexander, thanks again. Thanks for having me.
Hey everyone, welcome back. We've got two more talks for you today, so I hope you will stick around. Uh, remember to participate in the Discord channel, virtual.serverlessdays.io. The link is right there. Uh, get in, ask some questions. Um, we've got two more excellent talks that uh, uh, we'd love to get your input, in, uh, input on and then be able to ask those questions afterwards. So our next speaker is Marie uh, uh, Hager. All right, which I got wrong when I said the last time. So I'm trying hard to make sure that we pronounce these names correctly um, because it is important. And I, 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 I pride myself in trying to pronounce names correctly. So Marie Hager is here next to speak about serverless under the hood with Microsoft Azure Functions. Hi, my name is Marie Hager. I'm a software engineer at Microsoft on the Azure Functions team. Uh, and I'm here to talk to you about serverless under the hood with Azure Functions. So I want to start by talking about what this talk is not, because the title alone suggests at least two things that I'm trying to avoid. Uh, first, that this talk is just for people who know or use Azure, Azure Functions. I'm going to try my best to keep this at a high level um, so that everybody can learn from it without having prior knowledge. Uh, Functions is the serverless platform that I work on, and it's what I know best. And so my hope is that by going over some of the high-level concepts about the way that it works, it will give you a new way of thinking about serverless in general. Second, I'm talking about serverless under the hood, or how a serverless platform works, in the context of Azure Functions. So this is by no means a comprehensive overview of all serverless platform architectures. Um, I just don't know enough about them, and in many cases, that information is proprietary. So one nice thing about Azure Functions uh, is that most of its components are open sourced. So that makes it easier to go into some of the inside scoop without needing non-disclosure agreements or anything like that. So it's what I know and it's what I can talk about. So what is this talk about? To kind of re-emphasize what I've already mentioned, this talk is going to be a high level overview of how serverless works in Azure Functions. And once we have a basic conceptual model, I want to then go into an exploration of the limits of serverless by understanding the limitations of its components. Finally, I'll spend some time talking about some projects that stretch those limits. So I have to confess that this talk is going to give you what's well, uh, kind of close to a sales pitch about two of my favorite projects from my team. Stateful Serverless with Durable Functions and Serverless Scale in Kubernetes with Kata. When I talk about stretching the limits with, of serverless, these two projects are great examples. So this is just my fair warning that I'm like my, my sincere hope for this talk and the takeaways that you'll take um, are pretty broadly ap applicable to everyone and give you a new way of thinking. Uh, but again, there are some Azure specific elements. So with those disclaimers aside, let's get started understanding some platform components. Uh, first, what is the platform trying to do? And I'm sure you've seen a slide like this a million times, uh, but here are some of the three main awesome things that serverless gives us. A full abstraction of servers, instant scale, and paper use. In this talk, I'm going to simplify that definition down to mainly be about the first two, uh, because paper use is just a billing model that's allowed uh, because of the first two. So when we're talking about instant scale and server abstraction, here are some of the high-level components that we need. Code and config, execution environment, event source, and scaler. The execution and environment and code and code and config are closely related, but it's important to note that they are separate because one execution environment does not belong to that same user. The code runs in that environment, but all you own is the code and the config. Here, I'm representing a running instance where the code and the config are loaded into the execution environment. The separation of code and config um, from the execution environment is where that abstraction of servers comes into play. In Azure Functions, we have a scaler with various scaling algorithms that make decisions on how many instances of executing uh, scale units or execution environments uh, with running code should be up and running at any given time. The scaler takes in a lot of information when making its decision. For example, if my event source is a cloud queue, 
the scaler can peek at that cloud queue to check out the queue length um, and from there determine if it needs to add more instances to handle those messages. I won't go into too much detail around the specifics of all of you know, the logic around each of these event sources, but I do want to call attention to two facts. Um, one of them, that there is a scaler and it's an important component, and two, depending on the event source type, uh, the scaling logic and the information needed to make those decisions can differ. One thing that was implicit in the definition about serverless that I started with um, is that serverless code is event driven, obviously. Um, so code consumes events and code doesn't run unless there are events to consume. A quick implementation note, if you're wondering how events go from event source to code, um, in the case of Azure Functions, the Azure Functions host, uh, that component is mainly responsible for this. This is worth mentioning in the context of durable functions or stateful functions because that code, the Azure Functions host, um, it can transform events uh, before passing them to code. So that gives us a little bit more flexibility and power with what we can do. With that picture in mind, I want to talk about some serverless best practices and why they make sense. To list a few of those best practices, functions should be relatively quick, sh functions should, uh, sorry, functions should be relatively small, functions should be quick, and functions should be stateless. Let's take a look again at our components. Why should functions be relatively small? Before our running instance was up and running, our code and config lived outside of the execution environment like this. So now each time a new instance comes up, our code and config is loaded into the more generic execution environment. One reason to keep functions relatively small is because of the impact to cold start. Uh, code and config has to make its way over to execution environment. Another reason is that the execution environments tend to be very lean. From a platform standpoint, the trade-offs for near infinite scale um, is that each unit of scale or each execution environment should be as lean as possible with as little waste as possible. The execution environment could have a bunch of available memory and cores and so on, but if that code is only going to be responding to one event every day or something like that, there's a lot of wasted resources. This segues nicely into why functions should be quick. It's the same reason, platform trade-offs. Much like how a bank operates, if there's a run on cash uh, at a bank, then not everybody gets their cash. If there's a run on cloud for compute, uh, we'd run into a similar issue. Time constraints around execution time help prevent this from happening. Um, I should give a quick disclaimer, by the way, that everything I know about bank runs is from the movie It's a Wonderful Life, the Christmas movie, um, but kind of like the major theme, the, the metaphor uh, still stays the same. Uh, if there is a major run on compute, there would be issues. All right, the last best practice or really constraint um, that we'll cover is that functions should be stateless. Uh, this is because there are no guarantees around persistence outside of the scope of an individual execution. Let's take a look at a case when there are two instances of executing um, environments. They don't share memory, and subsequent executions of events, say an HTTP request from the same client, aren't going to be sticky to a given instance. We could go on like this, talking about different best practices and where they come from, but the key takeaway, I'm, or, or I guess not where they come from, but like factors that go into shaping them. Um, and the key takeaway here is that I hope you have now a high level understanding of pla the platform perspective um, and how that understanding can help you predict and avoid problems that you may encounter. Now that we went through things that we are constrained to do, uh, I want to talk about how we can push those limits. So this is kind of like the half glass full side of the talk. So here are a few things that I want to do that push the limits of serverless. Executions that take hours, better hardware, more flexibility and control over the environment, and no cold start. In thinking about how we could get to those, um, those places, I first wanted to bring us back to the four high-level components that we talked about. First, let's uh, look into executions that take hours. 
Does that mean our execution environment needs to change and we need to eliminate those constraints? Uh, how can we do this without the bank run issue that we talked about on available compute? Would something change about our execution environment? Or could we change something about what constitutes an event source to solve this problem? Second and third, uh, let's talk about better hardware and more control over the execution environment. That sounds like a pretty straightforward swap of the execution environment, but how much flexibility and control can we provide at scale as a platform? And finally, no cold start. This, I would suggest, is a change necessary with the scaler, as no cold start suggests at least one running instance. Again, how can we provide specific scaling behavior needs at scale at a, as a platform? Uh, like, would we just give that uh, always running instance for free or something like that? Um, so those are kind of like the, you know, the, the trade-offs in, in those limitations. Um, so let's first focus on that first limitation of serverless executions that take hours. One approach to handling this problem is stateful functions. Without needing to increase the execution time of an individual function, we can have long-running operations that work together by chaining smaller execution bits. Switching back to our high-level understanding of that platform, let's go deeper um, and, and see what can be done to preserve state between function executions. We said functions should be stateless because instances don't share memory and subsequent executions of events are not going to be sticky to a given instance. So what can be done? Um, I kind of like hinted at this earlier, but within the execution environment, the Azure Functions host is the go-between for events and user code. I also mentioned that the Azure Functions host can transform events that come from event, for, event source before passing it to cloud, or to, to the code, not cloud. Uh, the approach to stateful functions that we've taken then is to use cloud storage to preserve state between executions. The simplest example is a function chaining pattern. F1 executes and produces some state. F2 takes in that state, executes, and produces more state for F3, and so on. The state, with the, uh, the state of the previous execution is the event data, and the completion of a previous execution is the event source. So one thing that's unique about durable functions way of doing stateful serverless is that the pattern of function executions and passing state back and forth is all defined in code. This code that defines an orchestration is called an orchestrator function. Um, the, uh, the functions that are triggered um, are called activity functions. So orchestrations can be started with an event source that you define too. Let's see what this orchestration code is doing. F1, F2, and F3 are all being called and awaited on. So F1, F2, and F3 are the names of the functions um, that we already uh, defined, um, and they're all deployed in the same payload. They execute sequentially, as you can see in the code here, um, while taking the input from the previous activity function. Um, so you'll notice that this is the chaining uh, pattern that I just mentioned, but as code. So how does this actually work? Um, in the orchestration code snippet up top, um, I'm just calling one activity function, the say hello function. Uh, I'm awaiting its output and then ending the orchestration with the return value. The kind of secret sauce in how this works is the execution history being stored in a history table. Um, so I'm going to walk through a quick example of like how this snippet of code would execute. Um, first, my orchestration function is triggered. And so we hit that first line of code. And then in the history table, it is noted that the orchestration has started. Um, code continues to execute until we hit call activity async. Um, and that method checks the execution history to see if say hello function has been called before. And no, a call to say hello is not in the execution history. Therefore, the orchestrator queues an event to trigger the activity function, and then it goes to sleep, um, and it waits to be awakened by the next action. The activity function is triggered with the correct input, and the output is stored in the history table, so not passed directly back to the orchestrator, but put in the history table. 
Now the orchestrator function is played again from the very top. Again, it stops at call activity async and it checks for a result from say hello function. Uh, this time it finds some data and that data is hello world. Um, and now the orchestrator function can run to completion and return its outputs, um, which is hello world, the same as the activity function. Um, and then the orchestrator function officially completes um, and the history table and that execution history is finished. In this way, functions can trigger other functions and the state between them is passed. Resources aren't wasted when the orchestrator function is waiting either. So as you noticed in this kind of like walkthrough, um, it's, the orchestrator function isn't actively like executing while it's waiting. So it's not a machine that's out there that's constantly reserved. Um, you still get that serverless efficiency. Although each instance's compute power is still constrained and each individual activity function is still short-lived, when you can chain them together in complex orchestrations, the types of problems that you can solve with serverless solutions is hugely expanded. Here are six patterns that can be used and combined together, um, and I'll go through each of these in more details with code examples. In the fan out, fan in pattern, you can massively parallelize smaller chunks of work into functions and then wait for all functions to finish. Often, some aggregation work is done on the result of the return of all of those individual functions. Um, so in other words, you're kind of implementing a map reduce. Um, and there, there we go, that's, that's the waiting part. All right, so the async HTTP APIs pattern addresses the problem of coordinating the state of long running operations with external clients. So a common way to implement this pattern is by having HTTP call trigger the long running action, then redirect the client to a status endpoint that the client pulls to learn when the operation has finished. Um, so this is that um, call to start the long running operation. And then this is the part that returns a status endpoint for any other clients to be able to check in on the progress of that work. Um, this is another pattern, the monitor pattern, which refers to a flexible recurring process in a workflow. So an example is um, polling until a specific condition is met. Um, you can use a normal timer trigger to trigger executions, um, but its interval is static and managing instant lifetimes becomes complex. Uh, you can use durable functions to create flexible recurrent intervals, um, manage life manage task lifetimes and create multiple monitor processes from a single orchestration. So the other pattern here is human interaction. And many automated processes involve some kind of human interaction. Involving humans in an automated process can be tricky because people aren't as highly available and as responsive as cloud services. An automated process might allow for this by using timeouts and completion logic. Um, but here it is in durable, uh, where you create a timer and then you code that completion logic. Um, I'm gonna switch over to a quick demo. Here's my demo for um, showing that fan out, fan in pattern, uh, one of the first ones that I talked about, uh, which is also kind of the map reduce. Um, and so this is done in JavaScript. Uh, let's take a look at that orchestrator code. Um, some points to, to call out are this get repo files. Uh, that's the function that I'm calling. Um, and in this one, um, it is just making a call out to um, a GitHub APIs to get all available or all files that exist in a repo. Um, the problem that I'm trying to do is a regular expression search um, in a GitHub repo. Um, and so what I'm doing is I'm going to search through, like fetch the file content of each of these files and search for a regular expression match. Um, just a quick disclaimer, like this isn't the most efficient search or anything like that. Uh, I just wanted to show you kind of the power of like being able to, to um, you know, put out a bunch of work. And then here, uh, line 28, that's an important part where we're awaiting on all of these separate tasks going their separate ways to all finish before, um, uh, kind of like parsing through their results and then coming up with some meaningful data. Um, so I actually already started this orchestrator function because um, 
I have two instances of like OBS, the screen recording thing running. And so my computer, my little laptop is uh, doing a little bit of a, a struggly job. Um, but um, I, I'm going to go ahead and send a request. Um, yeah, VS Code is not happy. <laughs> All right, there we go. And I've started the orchestration um, going through the debugger. I'm actually going to unbreak this breakpoint too because it's going to hit multiple times. Um, I'm calling that activity function. Uh, it's finding me all of the paths that I need to look for. And now we finally, we, we actually got already, um, these are all the results of the searches. Um, so jumping back kind of like to the HTTP request there, um, what I was actually searching for here, I'll let this continue too. Um, yeah, go ahead, be free. All right, what, what I was actually searching for um, was, do, do, do. <laughs> All right, it, it is not free yet, there we go. Yeah, what I was actually searching for was uh, a regular expression that would help me identify if I accidentally checked in any secrets. Um, spoiler alert, I did check in like a fake secret into this repo, um, and so it's going to come up with a positive match. But have no fear, um, you can try to steal it if you want, but it's not going to work. Um, okay, so um, here it finally comes with uh, succeeded, and I actually started to um, two instances of like executions or orchestration executions. Um, and it, it tells me which paths are flagged as suspicious. Um, so one of them here is package lock.json. I don't really care. Like I don't have any secrets checked in there. Uh, but this one, octokit slash rest.js looks really, really suspicious. Um, so now with my regular expression search, uh, I was able to kind of track down that secret. Um, and, and again, um, this was running locally uh, with a machine that's already running pretty hard, and then there were two instances. But this kind of shows you, um, especially if this uh, if this was deployed to, to Azure, and there were like many many more instances uh, that needed to be spun up, um, then it would go to all these different machines, and you would get the serverless um, scale and the power of the cloud behind this regular expression search. All right, switching back. Um, so because durable functions relies on an execution history table to determine what to execute next, code in an orchestrator function must be deterministic. So don't use random numbers, GUIDs, etc. Um, and because of the state you passed each time, um, also avoid infinite loops. So I went into a little bit deep in the weeds in some parts and then glossed over details in other parts. But the main takeaways that I want um, are, first of all, that stateful serverless is cool and worth exploring, and you can do a lot of awesome patterns. Um, and second, I wanted to show how messing with the idea of what constitutes an event source can result in these types of cool patterns and expanded capabilities. For part two of pushing limits, I want to explore the idea of getting more control over your application by using containers and serverless scaling in Kubernetes. Let's go back to the serverless platform diagram. What if it looks something like this? There's a lot of power in just dealing with code and config, but that's not always enough. And I don't know if this is heresy to say, uh, but in some ways, a containerized application is actually the gold standard of server abstraction. Again, that, that might just be my own opinion. Um, but OK, so, so there are a few things that we can do with containers that aren't possible on a serverless platform. Uh, we can run on-prem, we uh, might have an easier time hitting compliance and consistency requirements, we can have specific compute requirements, and we, uh, in some cases for like big businesses, can leverage existing containerization investments. Um, so if we wanted to or were given a requirement uh, to run a containerized application, can we still get that instant scale to zero and event-based scaling that we know and love in serverless? Uh, I guess the spoiler alert is uh, yes, we can, and it involves Kubernetes. So Kubernetes orchestrates containerized workloads and services. 
Um, it provides a clean interface for managing distributed systems across many nodes, including replication, scaling, and state management. So Kubernetes is good at scheduling containers and capacity management. However, Kubernetes doesn't do event-based scaling. So that's where Kata comes in, um, which is an open source project that's based on the Azure Functions proprietary scaler. Um, and it's an event-driven scaler that is made for Kubernetes and it combines with other Kubernetes scalers. So before we talked about how the scaler takes in a lot of information when making the decisions, and that scaling logic can depend on event source type. The same is true with Kata, and you can write your own custom scalers for Kata. Uh, with Kata, these basic components roughly stay the same. Uh, we just wrap it in Kubernetes and replace the proprietary scaler with Kata. Similar to the quick overview of durable functions, um, with this Kata part, I wanted to first of all kind of highlight um, that you can get event-based serverless scale in Kubernetes, and it's cool to check out. Um, I think this blend of serverless and Kubernetes also shows that there's a balance to be struck between server abstraction and server control. So there are trade-offs with each of these options, and um, those trade-offs can be like captured in those same high-level components. Um, as my final parting thoughts, uh, my goal for this talk was primarily to build and grow an understanding of serverless from more of a platform perspective uh, from my experiences with Azure Functions. And I very much hope you learned something new today. Um, and if you want to learn more about Durable Functions or Kata, um, here are a few links to documentation that you can get started with. Um, thank you so much for listening to my talk. I know with virtual, it can be a little bit tough to sit through and stare at a screen all day, uh, but thank you for staying with me and um, enjoy the rest of the talk. Thanks again. All right, we're back. Thank you, Ma Marie. I appreciate the talk. Um, love the fact that you were talking about patterns. I'm a huge patterns guy, so I love um, when you get into all those different patterns, like the uh, the fan out and uh, and uh, asynchronous HTTP APIs and things like that. Um, so yeah. I have a couple of questions for you. One, I find Kata to be really, really interesting because I mentioned earlier, and if anybody's been watching since the beginning, maybe they saw me mention this, but I think there's this convergence of serverless and containers where you have containers doing more workloads um, that, that serverless applications or serverless functions maybe can't do. Um, totally. So just from a, um, you know, from a, I, I guess, I guess I think most people probably know how it works, but like within a container, how how does the code look in a container that's processing function or processing events off of um, you know when when Kate is scaling it? Yeah, totally. And um, so when we're kind of talking to like Azure Functions people, um, like usually people imagine it's just like oh it's like the Azure Functions runtime host. Uh, which is open source. And so we have kind of like these container images that you can write normal Azure functions with. But I think like the the super interesting part is that like that Azure functions component isn't necessary at all. Um, so Kata is just looking uh, for whatever kind of like event source you define it to look at. And then it's also operating by those scaling rules that you've also um, either like some, somebody else has coded those scaling rules or maybe you've coded that yourself. Um, and so kind of all that's required then, or all that you should really do is be consuming events uh, inside of that code. Right, so then in terms of building applications, especially with durable functions, because this is also an interesting uh, concept to me as well. Um, when you're building apps with durable functions, does it, does it get to a point where like a single app uh, or I guess a single durable function can't quite scale to a certain point, I mean, is that why we need to be thinking about Kata and and uh, and containers? Yeah, really good question, and I think part of it comes from like like this whole like I mentioned a function app uh, that's like a very Azure Functions specific context, <laughs> um, and so an Azure Function app is just like kind of the the unit of deployment where uh, you can write shared code and it all like you know gets deployed together, uh, but like. I, I should have emphasized this more, and so thank you so much for bringing it up. Um, each individual function like scales completely independently. And so um, I kind of broke it up into orchestrator functions and activity functions. But again, those scale like totally independently. Um, so it won't be that like, you know, um, my like I have like 
uh, hundreds of thousands of like activity functions spun up from one orchestration, but then it all has to like, you know, live in the same machine or anything like that. Those are all spread across like many different instances. Awesome. All right. Well, Mari, thank you so much for being here and for speaking. Um, we are going to take a quick break and then we are going to come back with our final talk, um, which is Nicole Yip and Hannah, T Hannah Tucker McClellan. Um, so we'll be back at uh, 55 past the hour, five minutes of, and we will see you. Thanks again, Mari. Thank you.
Hey everyone, welcome back. We are at our final talk for the day, and this is an excellent talk. Um, if you're like me, you grew up building all kinds of things with Legos. Uh, we get into this serverless thing, and it's been described as sort of Lego pieces, putting things together. So it's such a this weird meta cerebral thing that we've got going on here. But the Lego group is actually serverless, and they strive to become more and more serverless every day. So we have an excellent talk here with Nicole Yip and Hannah Tucker McClellan. They're going to talk about how they are continuously improving their serverless standards at the Lego group. Take it away. Thank you, Jeremy. So I'm Hannah Tucker McClellan, and alongside Nicole Yip, we are going to be talking about how we're continuously improving our serverless standards at the Lego group. I'm a junior application engineer, and I work in a product squad called the Vipers, and our focus is loyalty and accounts. I have a keen interest in serverless. I've been to a few conferences over the years, and in my free time, I enjoy getting involved with community projects. And now I'll hand over to Nicole to introduce herself. Thanks, Anna. So I'm doing too many things at once. I'm a senior form squad that we've called Houston, and I'll get a bit more into what squads we have in our team a few slides on. Personally, I've been working with production workloads in AWS for over four years now, years now. And this year, I've started to really get into crafting. I taught myself how to crochet. So this is Dino with his little laptop. And I've also started learning French. So a little bit more about the team that Hannah and I are in. So going fully serverless in July, and then a month later, we became the homepage for www.lego.com. In that time, we wrote around 20 serverless services, and since then, we've written 26 more. Um, and to support all of that, we grew from around 10 engineers to 50, and we broke up our squads from a front-end and back-end focus squad to seven product focus squads. So what that looks like is... Each of these squads are focused on a different area of the site. We have a squad that looks after checkout, we have a squad that looks after loyalty and account, and that's the squad that Hannah's in. Um, the platform squad wraps around all of those product areas and supports them from getting their code from commit all the way to production. Each of these squads are self-contained. They've got product owners, QA engineers, application engineers, and it means that they work with their stakeholders very closely in their product area and get um, front-end changes, back-end changes, through in, in their remit. So with all of that context of where we're from, where we are in the Lego group, the question is now, what does this talk about? Over to Hannah. So the problem we've faced is that our services grew quite organically around our product needs. We also had a growing list of products and a growing team. And we didn't have set standards across all of our services but we aim to keep up with the best practices and we were aware that the best practices are evolving quite quickly. So we had to figure out a way to keep up. So back to Nicole. So the question is, how do you know that you've built a good service? What does good even mean? What does that look like? And then once you've figured out what good looks like for your team, how do you get the rest of the team on board? How do you get them building to that standard and bringing up the existing services to that standard? And that's what this talk is about. As a platform squad, we reflected on what the latest practices were in both in the services that we had built recently and also in the wider serverless community. We brought all of those standards together and we implemented the standard across the team. And this talk is about what we put together into our standard and also what that journey was. We focused on code ownership and responsibility across the squads, as well as putting in place well, improving our communication between the different squads and putting some practices in place so that this standard could continue to evolve with the best practices in the industry. 
So we've broken the talk down into a couple different areas. I'll start off I'll with, start our, service with our service audit, audit. and then we'll, and then touch, we'll on the touch on the serverless lens, lens and how, and how we, incorporated we incorporated that into the service audit. Service audit. We'll then go through we'll some challenges, some challenges and, responses and responses that we encountered, that we encountered when, started when we started to roll out this new standard, with a spotlight, with a spotlight on, the on the Viper Squad to show how, to they, show how they responded and, and really took the service audit on. We'll then close with some advice to others based on our learnings and a sneak peek into what we're doing now and where the future is taking us. So let's start with the service audit. This was our answer to how do you know you filter good service and what does good look like for us? Back in October and November last year, the platform squad had a look at the services that we had built recently and put all of those um, practices and opinions into a big table in Confluence. And this was the basis of our checklist. It had around eight focus areas and we documented all of the guidelines in each of those areas. We also added a couple um, areas of advice on how to really operate and um, own the services from a, a platform and an infrastructure perspective. So for example, we added alerting and observability. So we put in guidelines to say, um, if you're writing a serverless service, if it's got a Lambda function, it should have an error and a throttle alert. If it's got an API gateway, you should have alerts for 4xx and 5xx errors. Um, another example is we added in middleware. So our newer services were using a middleware tool, but our older services weren't. And so we added that into the audit so that we could bring those older services up to the same standard as our newer services. So after we had brought together all of these areas and, and we knew that they were going to form the baseline of, of what our serverless standard is for the team, we then had to roll that out to the rest of the squads. The way we did that was after devising the criteria, documenting guidelines in each of those focus areas, we then audited all of the services that existed at that time. There were around 30. We then created JIRA tickets for each service and each part of the audit that they didn't meet the criteria on. And then we put all of those tickets into the backlogs for the product squads. We have biweekly tech reviews across the, across the team. And we took, up, took a couple of them to highlight each of the new areas that we had introduced in the serverless standard. So we ran a tech review on alerting. We ran a tech review on um, logging and, and how we should do that in a um, standard way across the squads. So for example, we talked about a, a logger that we had um, created and also what to do in each of the logging levels and what they should be used for, things like that. So that took place in November last year-ish. We started to roll them out in February and that coincided with something happening in the AWS serverless lens. So I'll hand over to Hannah to set the scene for this. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what the AWS serverless lens is. First of all, in 2015, AWS released their well-architected framework, which was essentially a set of guidelines based on input from their customers across different workloads. They then went forward to release some other lenses that focused on specific workloads. They also released the AWS well-architected tool, which was integrated into the console. And in February 2020, they released the AWS serverless lens, which was added to the well-architected tool. So we're going to have a little look at what the AWS serverless lens is and then compare it to what our service order is. The AWS serverless lens, in AWS's words, is a formal approach to compare your workload against best practices. It has five pillars. So there's operational excellency, uh, reliability, security, cost optimization, and performance. Essentially, the, they have a set of questions and a kind of checklists for all the best practices that you need to consider um, in your workload. And they also cover guidelines from across the board. Cool. So let's compare that with our service audit. The service audit was the answer of what a good service means to us. It's got eight focus areas, and these areas overlap with the five pillars. And I'll go through each of the pillars in a moment to see where that overlap happens. It's a collection of guidelines on how we implement each of those focus areas. And it only includes areas that each service owner needs to care about. 
there are some parts in the pillars that are owned centrally within the platform squad. And so the other product-based squads didn't need to know about them. So they don't feature in our focus areas. So let's take a tour through each of the five pillars and how our service audit overlaps with them. The first pillar is operational excellency. And this is where the most overlap occurs. So not only did we uh, pull standards from the, the newest service that we had services that we had written, we also added in new guidelines around how we operate and effectively own these services. So things like alerting guidelines, observability, logging, they all um, fall into this pillar. But also the application lifecycle management. So centrally, we own the pipelines on, on how code gets from commit into production. But there are two parts that we had to call out for each of the squads to, to focus on when they were building services. Um, one is the deployment mechanism. So in the guidelines, we say that you must use canary deployments when um, deploying your service. But you can only implement deploying, uh, sorry, you can only implement canary deployments once you've implemented alerts. And so that was something that had to live with the squads as they were building up their services. The other thing is integration testing. So again, we own the platforms, but we put in a switch. We, sorry, we own the pipelines. <laughs> so we put in a switch um, where the squads could configure that pipeline to add an integration testing in the correct areas, uh, in the correct places in the pipeline. And again, they could only enable integration testing once the integration test had been written. So those are the five areas that overlap in the operational excellency pillar. The next pillar is security. Broadly, this is covered by our architectural principles. So what I mean by that is when we started this whole process, we already had 20 to 30 services written, and they were adhering to some strict principles that our architect had put in place. And so long as squads are building services to those existing patterns, to those existing practices, we know that this pillar is covered. As the conversation is really taking off around the service audit, our serverless standard, we're going to use this um, AWS lens to fill in the gaps in our audit so that we know, um, well, so that we can explicitly define what our guidelines are in each of these areas. But for now, so long as the squads adhere to the existing patterns and practices we have in place, we know that this pillar is okay. One thing to call out is that uh, the implementing application security in your workload is currently owned by the platform squad. So this is things like um, the making sure that you're not using vulnerable versions of dependencies, making sure that you're scanning containers when you push new, um, new images, and also, owning all of the security services that monitor your AWS console or AWS account. So that's all owned within Houston. We have one focus area around secrets management that also fits into this area. And so I'm just calling that out in this slide. The last three, reliability, performance, and cost optimization, again, covered by our architectural principles. Um, and yeah, as we get the service audit really adopted by the, the engineers and, and rolled out, we'll be coming back and reviewing each of these pillars and explicitly defining what our guidelines are. But so long as the squads are building services according to those existing patterns and practices, we know that these pillars are covered. One thing to call out is we've added middleware, um, which overlaps with the cost optimization pillar. And you'll hear a little bit more about that from Hannah later on when we give the spotlight in on the Viper squad. So, in summary, the main overlap of our focus areas and our service audit is with the operational excellency pillar. And there's, there's actually one other that didn't overlap, which is documentation. And that was something that we added in because it really helps us with knowledge, ma knowledge management, knowledge sharing, um, and, and helping our services be a lot more maintainable. So now that we've talked about the service audit, what we included in, in our new standard, we now want to talk through a couple challenges and the responses we had to rolling out this new standard. So first we'll start off with Hannah, talking about the challenges faced from a developer's perspective. So our challenges, uh, bearing in mind that we did switch from monolith architecture to microservices architecture, and we did have this organic evolution of our services, it also meant that the biggest challenge was we didn't have a set standard across each of our services and the services were quite varied in terms of what they offered. And also the products that we had <clears throat> that we owned across the squads were quite different. 
The squads were also in various stages of operational maturity, and some of them will have had more future work to have to manage compared to the kind of ongoing tasks, which would fall like so if we were implementing some of the things from the audit, they would kind of fall into something that wouldn't necessarily be able to take the highest priority if there was a lot of future work to worry about. And so <laughs> so with all of that context of what the, the squads and the developers were um, facing, we found that the initial Big Bang release of here's a list of new standards and tickets and new stuff to do, it led to a lot of questions and uncertainty. Um, keep in mind, we were coming out of this 10 month long project phase, building new features and functionality. And then we were faced with the challenge of adjusting that balance to not only prioritize features and functionality, but to really improve the engineering standards of the existing services that we had in place. So because of this, we ended up with this tech debt mountain that was continually growing. And when we threw in the audit, it looked like we were adding onto that tech debt mountain. So the first thing as a platform squad we had to address was who owns what. So as I said before, we initially had a front end and back end focus squad. And after we went live and became the homepage for www.lego.com, we split these teams up into product focus squads that I showed you right at the start. Um, and then it took us until January this year to really go through each of the services and allocate them out to which squad should own which service based on their product area. And this timed really well with introducing the service audit because we could then go to each of the squads and say, so these are the services you now own. Here's a set of guidelines that if you implement, you can then own and, and operate these services effectively. So after we did that, we started to see a shift in ownership. We started to see the operational maturity building up in certain squads. And we ended up with a slightly mixed response and Hannah's already touched on why. Um, some squads inherited products that were already fairly mature and, and existing. So for example, checkout, that, that existed. Um, we also had some squads that were brand new, building up their products, and while they inherited one or two old services, they had to focus on delivering this new product. So, yeah, we, we ended up with a, a, a mix of responses to, to the yeah, service audit tickets being picked up across the team. But overall, the, the squads that could, they really wanted to own, they, want, they wanted to know more about how you operate a serverless platform. They wanted to own what they were building. And we found that the best way to gain momentum was by pushing one part of the audit at a time. So we decided that we should try and tackle observability, just one focus area. And the idea was that we should know what's going on in our platform ahead of anything else. After we decided this and, and um, communicated this to the rest of the squads, we started to see tickets being picked up. We started to have questions coming in. They were asking for clarifications. They were um, questioning the guidelines, asking for more information on how you implement the observability standard. A couple months after that, engineers were actually contributing back to the service audit. They were adding more focus areas. They were updating the guidelines into language that meant that made more sense to them. And some of them were even owning their services backlog. They were picking out parts of, that weren't included in the audit, but were just as important and when you're defining what a good service is. And you'll hear a little bit more about that when I hand over to Hannah. So let's see how the Viper squad responded to the service audit. So I'm going to just set the context of what the service audit was for our squad and, and how we responded. First of all, just to explain that for us, the audit really did do what it intended to in terms of setting out what the standards were, what the best practices were, and it gave us a broad area of focus to consider. And it also set out a bunch of requirements that we knew we had to implement. When we were faced with this task, we kind of realized that we needed to do a slightly more in-depth assessment of where our services were currently at. And we needed to think about the, the services from a developer perspective because there were things that we realized we needed to work on that weren't quite included in the audit. So what we did was we decided to look at what the audit required and also look at what we wanted to add to it or um, do more with it along the way and we set it out in a timeline. And what we ended up with is something that we started off calling the VIP tech debt roadmap. 
And on here, there were a list of the services that we owned and we set out a time frame for how we wanted to implement certain changes. And bearing in mind that some of these services are more complex or they're just larger and they would require, also if they're used more often, they would require a slightly different approach in terms of implementing the audit. So these are some of the areas that we kind of highlighted from a dev perspective in terms of the, the timeline where we wanted to do like add things or change things in our services. And what, I mean, we, we kind of, we've implemented most of these things that we set out to do, which is great, but it's also worth mentioning that a lot of these, thing, these things will be revisited and we will probably continue to improve on them and essentially, we were kind of looking at laying down the foundations at this point. And what I want to talk through and kind of highlight in, in for the rest of the, the time that I have is how we made the most of middleware. Because before we implemented some of the changes that were required from the order around middleware, we had these really long, complex handlers that were doing a lot of things. It was hard, for example, if you wanted to go and figure out what where an error was or why, why there was a problem, it would take quite a while to kind of sift through the code and figure out what it was doing. And we just didn't have standards across all of our services. They were written quite differently. Um, some of them were, like I said, older than others, and they, they had gone through that kind of organic evolution. We also had a bunch of repetition that we realized we could really cut out if we focused on middleware. So what we ended up with was just essentially the, the benefits of middleware. And this is something which I think really works well if you've got serverless architecture. Uh, we ended up with a standardized wrapper that we could use across each of our services. And we essentially just moved all of the, the dev stuff that people have to do um, around web requests, for example, like error handling, validation, SQS passing, that kind of stuff. We could just move that straight into the, the middleware. We could also integrate with our logger and metrics. And essentially, we did what we wanted to do, which was leave the handler as business logic only. And this meant that our services were much more maintainable and easier to work with, essentially. And a little bit of a note on some of the developer improvements that we added, some of which were partially required by the audit, but we also kind of highlighted as something that we wanted for ourselves. Um, so that was like adding typing to all of our services and also um, improving, making improvements on the dependencies. So some things were required, but at the same time, because of the fact that a lot of things are changing in the in the serverless world, there are often version changes that have a bigger impact on our services. So we wanted to go through and make sure that we were using the best versions and that everything was as stable and as kind of written in the best way it could be. We also made sure that we were using structured logging everywhere, and we just had this standardized logging across each of our services. The other things that we focused on, which were we found to be like hugely beneficial for us, were things around the documentation and just making sure that we were keeping track of the changes we were making. And if anyone wanted to, to make any further changes or find out what was going on in our services, all of that information would be readily available. And that just set the stage for future improvements. And it also meant that as a squad, we did feel more like we owned our services. So the next part of our talk is just about some advice we would give to others if they were going through the same journey and just some sort of thoughts based on our experience. So a bit from me, um, the first thing is that we found having that time frame was a really good thing because we actually could kind of manage our, our work a bit better. We had uh, a bunch of tickets that we added that were all kind of color um, color coded and 
uh, were based on um, each of the services that when we were going through sprint planning, we could just say, oh, well, how much can we do this sprint? And we could pull some tickets into the sprint, which just worked really great, especially when we checked back on the time frame to see how we were doing. Um, yeah, it also helped in terms of uh, making sure that we balanced our priorities, but also it gave us that initial time to assess what we already had to try and see where there might be gaps or which services needed a bit more improving than others. The other thing we did was we encouraged ex exploration tickets. So I don't know, say if there was a dependency that we weren't sure if we wanted to bump up or if we needed to add something new, we would kind of go and explore that. And alongside that, we set up weekly sessions where we could just share knowledge and it was just half an hour every week where we could bring any problems or even just interesting things that we'd figured out along the journey. And we that in that way, we kind of kept all our knowledge visible and we allowed um, like for getting feedback from other people in the squad and just kind of making improvements or, or talking about blockers along the way. The last thing we did that we found was really useful was we used and customized certain helpers like we, I mean, we have linting rules and we have PR checks and we um, updated some of those in line with some of the standards that we wanted to, to, to keep up and to, to have as we were working on our services. So yeah, that's kind of um, our advice. And I'm going to hand back over to Nicole to talk through some more advice. Thanks, Hannah. So some advice on if you're uh, approaching this from having to actually implement this uh, a serverless standard or, or to document what your current standard is at the moment. Um, you know that you will always have blind spots and the best way to reduce those blind spots is to take the engineers on the journey with you. We found that taking an iterative approach and rolling out one part of the audit at a time meant that you could really focus the engineers efforts and um, you could educate the, the engineers in one part and, and focus on what they were going to work on for a length of time and get that adopted across the team a lot faster. Always welcome feedback and contributions. The standard needs to be keeping up to date with the best practices and who better to do that than the engineers that are working in serverless. We identified, supported and encouraged champions. This was the best way to clone ourselves, get the knowledge out there around each of the focus areas. And it meant that we formed a really close relationship with some of the squads that were really jumping into the operations side of, of a serverless platform. And it also meant that we could encourage cross collaboration. So if another squad started asking similar questions that another squad we had already, um, I guess, trained up or, or um, supported, we could point them at, at that champion and encourage this cross collaboration between the product squads. And it meant that the platform that we're all looking after levels up at a similar rate. The most important thing, if you take one thing away from this talk, aim for adoption and ownership. The standard is not meant to be something that's owned by a platform squad or owned centrally. It's meant to be something that the, the engineers implementing it feel like they own, that they're keeping up to date with the best practices in the industry and that um, they, uh, they're living and breathing and knowing what a good service looks like. So, that's our advice. Let's take a quick look into what we're doing now and where we want to go in the future. We're going to continue building momentum around implementing this new standard. The next thing we're going to tackle is alerting. So now that we know what's going on in our serverless platform, we now want to know when things start going wrong and not be watching dashboards to try and find out when things happen. Um, we're also aiming for collective ownership, so encouraging more feedback, more um, focus areas to be added into the audit. Um, and yeah, just aiming for getting the service, services audit out there and known by more people in the team. We're also looking to extend our automation. So Hannah mentioned we've got linting and PR checks in place at the moment that are getting the standards in front of the engineers as they're writing their code. We want to extend that even further and maybe explore gamification. So the idea being that we can have squad level dashboards where a squad can have a look at what services they own, maybe a score against this, um, this service audit that we've created, and maybe even a leaderboard. So bringing in that competitive element to continue building and maintaining that momentum and getting the squads feeling like they own their services and that they're owning what they're building. So in summary, we went serverless. 
And since then, we've been continually raising the standard on what a good service looks like to us. Around the end of last year, start of this year, we started to formalize and document what that standard was. And since then, we've been building momentum from implementing an audit to having the engineers adopt it. And sometime soon, they'll be owning the audit. So that's our talk. Thank you for listening. You can find Hannah and I on Twitter and also have a look at our Medium publication where you'll find blog posts on what we're doing in serverless and also what it's like to be an engineer in our team. Yep. Thanks for listening. And if you've got any questions for us, we're here and happy to answer them. Awesome. All right. Uh, thank you both. Amazing talk. And, and one thing, um, you know, I've been involved with serverless for quite some time. Um, and uh, and I remember Sheen Brizzles giving uh, talks way, way back when, way back when, like what, maybe a year and a half, two years, something like that. Uh, and the progress that the Lego group has made, it's just amazing. And what one thing about serverless is not reinventing the wheel, right? I suggest any company that is starting the serverless journey is somewhere on the serverless journey. Take a look at your slides. Take a look at what the Lego group has done um, and just the... the uh, the amazing progress that you have made and where you've gotten to. I mean, that congratulations to you and to you know your entire team because it is uh, it is it's really great to see what what your team has done. Oh, thank you. Um, all right, so a uh, couple of quick questions here. Uh, let's see. You know, you you uh, you have a lot of different things that you cover within the audits, but are you are you satisfied that like you've covered everything, or are there more things that you want to add in in the future? So, yeah, the the audit is always going to be something that evolves. So, what we tried to capture with this first pass of an of an audit or a serverless standard is um, what our newest what our newest services have in place but also what we need in place in order to operate a serverless platform. So that's that's where we are at the moment. And then we covered that the serverless lens is introducing a lot of other aspects that we want to explicitly define in that audit. So yeah, we'll, we'll be expanding the audit and adding in um, areas that are informed from the serverless lens. Right. So now with the serverless lens, so I, the questions in the serverless lens are still a little bit general. I mean, you really have to get down into understanding how you know how a good application looks in your organization. So, what were some of those considerations um, you know that you your team made when thinking about what was going to go into that audit? Again, it was um, it was thinking about operating a serverless platform and what needed to be in place in order for us to know when things were going wrong. If something goes wrong, being able to debug that quickly, um, and if the and I guess preventing something from going wrong from the start, so um, including canary deployments. So it was all of those things that we were already talking about that we just collected the opinions and the questions and the pain points, and we brought it all together in the service audit. Awesome, all right. And then this question uh, came from somebody on the chat. Uh, so are, have any of these improvements that you've made um, like how have they impacted the business? Have you been able to tie like the 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 audits back to business value? So at the moment, we've been focusing on pushing one part of the audit, observability. And we actually had a record sales period a couple months ago, and the business was asking, can we see metrics? Can we see dashboards? Can we see what was happening in the platform? And thankfully, we had, this, um, we had implemented observability in our serverless platform. So we could show the metrics on you know, how many Lambda functions had we had running at that time. Um, right. What what kind of um, throughput did we see? And so, yeah, the, the business has benefited from that part of the audit particularly. And yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, listen, thank you both again for that. And thank you for the work that the LEGO group has been doing. Like I said, I think you uh, and your team have set like the new standard for how to, you know, sort of work through um, this process of implementing serverless. So thank you both for being here. Um, we really appreciate it. Thank you for having us. Thanks. All right. Um, okay. That's it. That's the end of the. Um, that's the end of the broadcast or the end of the the conference. Um, and uh, uh, Hannah and um, Nicole, you can drop off if you want to. We're doing this live, so we're you know we're <laughs> we're trying some different things here. Um, but anyway, so I want to thank all of you for uh, being a part of this. Uh, I want to answer. 
Thundra, again, uh, serverless and container uh, and microservice observability. You can check them out at thundra.io. Stackery for, uh, for helping to collaborate and coordinate on um, your serverless application deployments uh, at stackery.io. Senzo is a training platform. Um, you can check out their homeschool offering at uh, homeschool.dev and Epsigon, another excellent um, observability platform for serverless containers and microservices. You can check them out at epsigon.com. Um, also, I want to thank all of the speakers. I think there were some amazing talks in here. Hopefully, everybody listening learned something. Um, and of course, I have to thank the uh, the big four who make all this possible. Uh, we have Emra, Ant, uh, Gunner, and um, and Farah. Thank you. I want to bring them in now, if I can. Uh, hopefully, we can do that. Um, are you Are you there? Are you joining me? Can you hear me? Hey. I can Hello. hear you. Yes. All right. Hello. So, anything anything that uh, that that one of you would like to uh, like to share? Uh, well, I guess I've been nominated to talk this time, and I wore my hat that uh, I was given at uh, Serverless Days uh, in Australia, uh, just because I was sad I wasn't being wasn't able to go this year. So I wanted to make sure to represent. But just wanted to really thank Jeremy. Thank you so much for joining us this entire year. We hope that you'll do it again next year. Uh, like you are so amazing, just you know, and the presentation of it all, and just kind of rolling with the punches. So again, we appreciate you. A huge, huge thing. Thank you to all of the organizers. Uh, planning this event with all of you has really helped me to get through 2020. It's helped me to know that I had friends on the other side. And the same with this entire community. So thank you so much to everybody for joining us. Uh, you know, month uh, every. You know, we're trying to make sure that we get this uh, all right for everybody. And um, anyhow, we're really, really looking forward to being back next year. And a huge thanks, thank you to all of our speakers and uh, sponsors. Um, and we're looking forward to uh, hopefully a better 2021. Uh, and thanks again for joining us. All right. Thank you, everybody. That wraps us up. Um, the replay of this is available. So if you only caught part of it, go back and watch, um, watch it. Um, everyone stay safe for the rest of 2020 and into 2021. Um, enjoy the rest of your year and we will see you soon probably on the internet but we will see you so thank you thank you everybody have a great rest of the year